We're live, three, two, one. Thanks everybody <laughs> for joining us. Uh, I'm Jeremy Boren, God King of the Daily Wire. That's lowercase g, lowercase k, if anyone's <laughs> uh, keeping score at home. Uh, and I'm here with uh, my pals, uh, Michael Knowles, Andrew Clavin, and the one and only Ben Shapiro. And the point of tonight is uh, that we're hanging out. We're watching the State of the Union. We wanted to invite you guys back to uh, kind of uh, our lives a little bit. The point of tonight won't really be talking about uh, <laughs> politics, although whenever we're together, we talk a lot about politics. And we're going to watch the speech, so probably a political thing or two will come up. Uh, but uh, really, it's just a chance for us to engage uh, with you guys and say, hey, Come hang out in our office and enjoy a nice cigar, enjoy a little bit of a whiskey, all things in moderation, my friends, and uh, <laughs> in, including, including in moderation, uh, listening to the words of our president. <laughs> so, yeah, why are we here? Yeah, yeah. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> if you're watching on Facebook or, uh, yeah, 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 exactly. if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube uh, live stream, uh, we want you to go up, hit follow, hit subscribe. If you're on YouTube, go ahead and ring the bell. If you're on Facebook, turn on your notifications. You know, social media is kind of hard on us conservatives out there, and we could use all the help we can get getting our message to you. We also have the lovely, the talented Elisha Krauss. Uh, she's with us. She's going to be taking questions from you all night in the comments uh, on whatever platform you're watching. Elisha will be curating those, and we'll kick it to her every now and then so that she can bring us uh, your questions, and we can bring you answers actually seems like an not. overreach <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not a thing it's late. It's it's late. Late. Yeah. Yeah. we will respond <laughs> uh, Knowles will stare blankly into the camera <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to the Daily Wire State of the Union coverage the greatest president that God ever created okay so first of all is anyone here going to see Black Panther? Because I've heard that it is actually against the law to <laughs> criticize this film. <laughs> this is, this is... I haven't seen it, but it's wonderful. It's really, really good. <laughs> I really, really like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's just really like, like Wonder it. Woman, right? Which is the greatest movie that has ever been made. Like, the thing is, when I when I watched it and then it was pretty good, I sort of I still felt bad. I felt like I was still incomplete. <laughs> it, had, it had to somehow rank it between Gone with the Wind and Citizen mm -hmm. Kane. Yeah. They, I like I like the women who cried when they saw it because finally a woman had won World War One. You know, <laughs> it's about damn time, yeah, you yeah, ask exactly. me. No. So yeah, I'm very excited about Black Panther. So that's yeah, that, yeah. that's ranking high on my on my list of priorities. It's, I'm gonna say something blasphemous. The, the trailer for Ant Man is better than the trailer for Black Panther. <laughs> I know we're not allowed to say this. Well, you're, you're okay. like small. Well, mm -hmm. you know, they're gonna knock down the doors. That's, that is fair. <laughs> there are those who would say. <laughs> you know the thing about it though is they will find something to complain about, like uh, someone didn't win the right award for Black Panther. So I, also, I wonder not only who will get in trouble for saying something less than perfect about Black Panther, but then how they will complain about Black well, Panther. Well, it won't win any awards, right? So Wonder Woman didn't win any awards, and that was the big right. thing. They didn't get magic gold statuettes. They're all very wealthy, and they're all very famous, but they didn't get little <laughs> gold statuettes. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I've been handicapping the Oscars. You guys been handicapping this thing yet? No. I've seen that so, movie. So so yeah, I've been, so I've been trying to get Drew to loan me his screeners. <laughs> Drew is the only honest man in Hollywood. We, we at, so Drew belongs to the Writers Guild, right. uh, having accomplished books with words. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And they provide him with screeners for all right. of the nominated films uh, to get his opinion on them. And uh, when you live in Hollywood, you pretty much live, especially when you're young and poor, on a steady stream of borrowed screeners right. from your pals. Like, I probably have a stack at various times in my life of hundreds of these screeners. I mean, I never really watched them. I can't confess to that, but I have them. <laughs> Uh, Drew, the one man in Hollywood who will not own a screener, when asked about it this week, said they find people hundreds of thousands of dollars for this. You have to you have to understand each one of these starts with a notice from the FBI, yeah, that's right. and we know how honest they are. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Saying they will hunt you down. When, when my son was little, he asked if he could. He, he, he just borrowed without asking. He borrowed one of my screeners and took it to his friend's house and left it there. Oh and I was like, get it. <laughs> With the voice echoing. That's when you lost all your hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just have a full head. <laughs> yeah. So but, uh, they do find. They do say they find you, and they watermark them. And they everywhere. even have an insurance policy if you lend it to one of your friends. Yeah. Really. Yeah, so I don't know what it means. Yeah, there were memoranda written about this. But uh, people I kick yeah. the door in That's and everything right. like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I've been doing the PC handicapping because okay. I, this is how it works, right? I mean, so last year Moonlight won because obviously gay, black. It was the intersectional, underprivileged the intersectional movie of the year. My right? God, right, if they, right. somehow the kid had been transgender, they just would have—they they would have actually forced you with your eyes open like a Clockwork Orange to watch it. But it, but this year it looks like to me, Get Out and uh, mm. and Shape of Water are going to be the two front runners just yeah. from that. So yeah. you and I have a significant disagreement about Get Out. I said on the show today, I think it's a racist film. 
Uh, you think that you think that I, I it's not so much. I don't care that it's a racist film because it's a horror movie. It's I don't see why a black guy can't use his racist paranoia to make a horror movie, just like we all. Make. Okay, but the, but the, you admit, but the Stepford Wives is like a really anti-man film. Yeah, right, but a good horror movie. Right. Okay, that's that's fine. Okay, so yeah. we don't actually disagree and, on this. And there, there is a moment in the in the book of the Stepford Wives, one of my favorite. It's actually one of my favorite moments in thrillers, where they come out and the, he, one sentence where he tells you that their children are happier. After they become stepford wives, <laughs> the children are actually happier and better behaved. And then that line That's just, just disappears. <laughs> so, and you think, well, maybe it's worth it then, you know? <laughs> okay, so, so I don't want to like monopolize the, the, no, no, the no, questions no. and the conversation, but now uh, I, I do want to turn to, you know, this guy speaking for the State of the Union. <laughs> this guy. Uh, and the, the, president, the president, 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 this president guy Trump. You, yeah. And I don't want to repeat the, 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 the sight of him when they announced the President of the United States and all the Democrats sitting, and then him clapping for himself as he walks out, just like he does for every speech. It's going to be spectacular. So I am, I am looking forward to it. Um, but I think we have to do a couple of things. One, we have to do kind of grades for year one. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I think that we should also probably talk a little bit about all of the FBI scandal stuff, the memo gate and all of the rest of yeah. this, because... Yep. And why don't we pick one of these to start with? You want to you start the grades for year one? Yeah, I think we're probably going to go grades for year oh, one, okay. uh, just so we can at least, I mean, we've we've shared some laughs. <laughs>, laughs. We've proven that we're friends, and now we'll put the theory to the test. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So Great, grades who wants for year to go one. first? Knowles, you get to go first. And that well, way, if you say something wrong, I can fire you. And by you. the way, I, I like the Bruce Wayne get up. I just oh, so this old thing? Well, I figured we're just hanging out. You know. I actually forgot we were filming tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I don't know. There's not a great. Is there a grade above the the A? Is there a grade above it? Is there some letter that I didn't know about <laughs> in some ancient Aramaic or something? That I, I'm really pleased with it. I obviously I'm a I'm a fan. I'm a convert, you know, to uh, to the Trump train. The, there you was have the zeal of the newly converted. I do as well. have the yeah, idea. Yeah, as I'm like you know, like burn heretics the whole deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I always have that opinion. <laughs> the uh, the one the one mistake was the Sessions recusal. So that is why he doesn't get the. Oh, A. that was the one mistake. That's the one. We found it. We found the one mistake. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mm. care all the other stuff, like the Stormy Daniels or whatever nonsense they dredge up. I don't care about any of that. The Sessions recusal was really. You think he's right to fire Tommy? Yeah. You I, yeah. Uh, you I think agree with Chuck Schumer on that. Yeah. You think he's smart to fire Tommy? <laughs> yes. Okay, and uh, and how about Charlottesville? Because those uh, were the two yeah, big boobos okay, to me. All right, all right. Uh, Charlottesville was uh, uh, inarticulate. He could have quit while he was ahead at various points of that, I think. I think it was, it was a little bit bungled. It's not enough, given all the good stuff we got and, right. his, and his performance after the Charlottesville response. I'm not going to ding him on it to the degree that I would ding the Sessions recusal. But that was a flub. He could have, he could have done better. I'm willing to. Okay, so, so, so A from you. How about you? I, I, a minus. I give him A minus. A minus. No, I, see, I, I definitely give him an A on the overall Trump year. I think it was an amazing year for conservatives. I think, you know, you, you always you can't judge a president on what he doesn't do. You have to judge him on what he accomplished. And the judges and the deregulation, which I'm a big fan of deregulation, obviously, and the ta- tax reform, the tax cuts, the economy, the dinging, the constant dinging of the press, which I, I, will talk, I could talk about for an hour, which I think has been great. I think he has put the press on the defensive. They now, the, the media now acts the way Republicans act around the media. Republicans act around the media like abused children. Abused children are always afraid to say the next thing because they never know when daddy's going to start wailing away at you. And that's the way Republicans have behaved around the media for the last 30 years. Now the media acts that way. They're even acting that yeah. way about the State of the Union before he's even said anything. Mm-hmm. They're saying, I don't care if he's presidential. He's not. Don't say he's president. You know, they're really uh, worried about what happens when Trump uh, meets the public directly. The Trump of it all is a weird problem for me. Uh, the, the, the Trumpy, like, rudeness, the bullying, the flubs, and, and the things that he says. You know, Charlottesville, I was not as upset as you were because I thought he was actually saying, trying to say something different than he said, but it was tone deaf. I, I, I can't separate the things that he does that I find appalling, you know, with, with the accomplishments he's had, because I actually believe the left has succeeded in wrapping our conversation in this uh, straitjacket of, of fear so that m- millennials won't say what I'll say because I grew up in a different time, you know, mm-hmm. time traveler at this point from another age. You know, I, I will say anything and millennials won't say them because they, they already know that that's as, as much as their reputations, as much as their careers are worth. And he's broken through that. Do I wish he had broken through it with grace and wit and style? You bet I do. <laughs> has, has he done that? 
No. But I'm not sure in this day and age that anything but the sledgehammer of Donald Trump, which really does still appall me and goes up my gentlemanly spine, I'm not sure that anything else would have accomplished. You mean like the Overton window? window. That, yeah, uh, yes, you're allowed you to shifted talk the about. Overton window. Okay, yeah. so but what's to, nice but, about this? But, but what's I have nice to give about an this, A in terms of conservative. Okay, so what's nice about this room is that it's divided right along the center. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so now from so on high, an, the guy did you explain to them that we're not really in the same room? In fact, we're just plexiglass <laughs> 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 right here. Yeah. But from this side of the Mason Dixon line, uh, I would say, yeah, I mean, to the extent that you're what you're describing is the two Trumps uh, on on policy. I think Trump is. Uh, given us a terrific year. I think that we sometimes in conservative media have a tendency to overstate how good a year it's been. Uh, and I think that we right now in the conservative media have a tendency to understate any past Republican accomplishments of the last 50 years. Um, and that bothers me. Uh, but even with that being said, it's still been a terrific year. We've gotten some great judges, great deregu deregulation, some great policies. Uh, we got tax reform to whatever degree we got it. Uh, meaning I don't think that the tax reform that we got is as great as the tax reform that we uh, say that we got. Uh, and I think that we've gotten tax cuts in the past and we pretend that we haven't gotten them now because well, we, we want to elevate reform like this in the past. Uh, we've gotten tax cuts in the past and this reform other than the corporate tax I mean, rate is basically a tax the whole cut. Thing. That's, That's the it. whole thing. Though. I mean, but it wasn't pitched that way, so that's right. uh, so I, I agree. With, uh, listen, I, I really like the tax bill, but what it was Absolutely. pitched at and what it delivered are actually two different things. So what mm -hmm. it delivered was corporate tax cuts. It was pitched as an individual tax right. cut. It's not. That's sure. right. right. If you want to talk in terms of individual tax cuts, you have to talk about Reagan lowering the top tax bracket from seventy percent to twenty eight. Right. Um, but is it? But yeah, I mean, I, I obviously. But, but go, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll finish my grading here. My problem, where I really, there, I have two issues that divide me from uh, the gentleman from New York and the gentleman from. <laughs> It's Long Island, New York. It's our country. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that is that I don't think that you can talk about what the president does and what the president says, because I think that the number one thing that the president does is say things. That the job well, certainly of the president. Yeah. <laughs> the job of the president is as much the bully pulpit as it is any individual policy. Many of the things that we disliked about Barack Obama were rhetorical. They were the way that he never uh, even pretended to be the president uh, of the people in this room. He never pretended to be the president of Republicans. He referred to Republicans yeah. as his enemies, uh, as the enemy of his constituents uh, all through uh, his tenure. I don't like that Donald Trump does that same thing uh, where the left is concerned. I don't like the continuing uh, polarization of America, not just along political lines, but along partisan lines. I think we can win political arguments. I don't know that we will win in the long run partisan uh, arguments. I especially think that because of the, the age um, barrier that you're referring to, the fact that people under 40 reject the president in, in ways that people over 40 do not, I think that that, that doesn't bode well for us in, in terms of uh, our partisan success over time uh, under the president. So with that said, I, it's hard for me to give him an A, even though on policy, certainly, I would give the president an A. But I think that, that the things that he says matter. Um, in the moment, they can, it's fun to celebrate them. He's, he's funny. He punches all the right people most of the time. I think sometimes we ignore that he punch, you know, there are people take some friendly fire. Yeah, no, <laughs> no question, no question. Uh, absolutely. No. But on the, on the whole, it's fun to watch him be Trump. He has put the bully into bully pulp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but I worry that there's consequences. Not only do I find it distasteful, but I worry that there's consequences. And, and that brings me to the thing that I have the most concern about uh, in the era of Trump, and that is not what Trump says or does, but what Republicans and conservatives say and do in defense of Trump, uh, which is where I think that we have uh, the most liability right now. It, it bothers me that we can't um, say that what he does is good when it's good, but also say that what he does is bad when it's bad. Uh, I think that because we um, have, have become so reactionary and partisan, in my opinion, uh, that we're losing credibility with anyone who doesn't already agree with us about the guy. We no longer seem like honest uh, purveyors of an ideological, uh, which we can discuss the nature of ideology, but we're no longer uh, uh, purveying an idea uh, I worry that we're only supporting a man, and I think that that doesn't work well for conservatism over time. Yeah, it's, it's not it's not traditional conservatism. I, I do think there is a segment of his base that is so rock solid uh, that it's it, it, it's impressive 
But it, that worries me, too, the, the, the fact that he is such a big personality. Yeah. You know, it's when, when we talk about the character of, of the presidency, and does it matter that the president is, has a lack of character? I mean, there's no other way to put it. He is not somebody who you'd want babysitting your children. He is not somebody who you'd probably consider a personal friend. Yeah. He's, not, he's not that guy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, not to, not to go ancient philosophy, but even Aristotle recognized that it didn't, you didn't have to be a good person to be a good citizen. But, what, but it is also true that there are consequences to the nation for having a bad man, even if he is doing good things for you. And I agree with everybody and everything that's been said about policy. Obviously, I've said, I said, it, to, I've said it directly to top members of the administration that on policy, particularly executive policy, I'd give him an A minus. You when wore the hat after Gorsuch. That's right. When, <laughs> listen, when, when he does good things, I cheer him as loudly or more loudly than, than anybody else. But when he does bad things, I think it is incumbent on us to, to speak up. And we don't, uh, there, there's, there's a tendency not to. And that's why when mm -hmm. Mitch McConnell says best year for conservatism in a long time uh, or in 30 years, I will say in terms of conservative policy, I probably agree with that. In terms of for conservatism, there's two ways to, to judge the year and one has not come in yet. Right? So way mm -hmm. one is we can judge it on the policy and way two is what is the effect of that year? Right? How, how are we actually going to, how, how does this play out over time? So yep. let's say that he has made all the causes that I love and that you like and all the policies that we love, what if he's made those toxic, right? What if, what if, like, to take an example that is close to my heart, obviously, I actually, I think that most Republican presidents would have done the stuff that he did, except for one thing where I give him 100% credit, which is the moving of the embassy to Jerusalem. Right. I think it takes a man no who does not care about any of the norms right. to do something like that, and he's totally right and good for him and full marks. Now, what if his toxicity actually makes that an unpopular position, a much more unpopular position than it was before? And you've seen this in all of the areas where he's injected himself into culture. So, for example, the NFL fight, which I'm sure you guys celebrated and thought, oh, this is great. Yeah, he's taking it to the... Okay. Okay. So I will show you why... I will tell you why I don't think it's great. Okay. The reason that I don't think it's great is not because I think he's wrong. I think he's 100% right, mm -hmm. obviously. The reason that I think that it's, that it's bad is that if you look at the opinion polls, and I know we're not supposed to pay attention to polls anymore, but I think they are reflective of something. Okay, if you look at the opinion polls on how many people thought... They're reflective of fake news, Ben. Right? Yeah, they're, they're sometimes <laughs> you know, reflective of things. Cigar, yeah. and I just don't feel wise enough. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, you, may, you look much wiser now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, now, tell me looks wise those those bubbles. Bubbles. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So now that, now that we've gotten that out of the way, I, I think that, you know, the, the problem is that if you look at, if you look at the polls on the, on the patriotism question, uh, on, on whether you should actually stand for the anthem or not, what you see is that before Trump intervened, 75% of the American public thought you're an idiot if you kneel for the anthem. After Trump intervened, 55% of the American public thinks you're an idiot if you kneel for the anthem. So right. he can win a personal victory because that's a popular issue, obviously. But if Hillary Clinton had, had said anything, let's say, God forbid, Hillary were president, and Hillary had said anything that lowered by 20% the number of Americans who thought it was bad to kneel for the anthem, we would say that's a terrible effect. Look what she's done. Okay, and this is, this is the problem with him being personally toxic. He can say things I like, and now I actually have a stake in him not being personally toxic. Like, if he were representing policies I don't care about, I wouldn't have a stake in his character. Then I'd just be like, okay, he's a bad character, he's doing crap I don't care about, who cares? But if he does stuff that I really like, and I want to see Victor Horius, and I, I speak to young people all the time, and I want to see young people fall in line behind a lot of the ideas that he's actually winning for, then he needs to be good at promulgating those ideas, not just getting them implemented. The president has power because the president's the president. But... What happens in 2020? What happens in 2024? What happens when there's a poll that shows Republicans under the age of 30, 75% of them want Trump primaried in 2020? Okay, that's not good for, for no, conservatism. I, but, right. there, but you've made a good point, which is that you now have stake in his uh, personal success, his personally being likable. There are, uh, there are issues where half the, we're so partisan now, we're so divided, that if Mitt Romney, the most likable Republican there is, if he intervened, half the country would oppose it, even if that weren't necessarily the case. Now, this that is, I, that looks delicious. That's amazing. If, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, the question of uh, conservatism, I think, is one that we should talk about. Because I do, I do disagree a little bit. That, so let's talk about it. Okay. But let's talk about it after mm. uh, we allow Ben to catch some air and we go to Alicia, who's ready with a few, uh, the first uh, set of questions. Nope. Alicia, hey. we have you. Hey, guys, how are you? Hi, Alicia. Hey, everyone. I'm Alicia Krause. And to have your question heard, as Jeremy said earlier, you can just ask away in the comment thread on our live stream on Facebook, YouTube, or dailywire.com. We'll pull your questions and the guys will answer them live on the air. So be sure to direct your question towards either Michael, Andrew, or Jeremy, and if you really have 
have to, uh, you know, <laughs> bed. <laughs> so it'll be lots of fun. And don't forget, anyone, this isn't like the conversation where only subscribers can ask, but we do love it if y'all subscribe. Anyone can ask on Facebook, YouTube, or DailyWire.com. Right. And if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, again, we're going to hit this uh, several times over the night because you probably have read the news about algorithm changes, about ad blocks, about shadow bans, about blacklists. Uh, we struggle to get our message to you. We want to be able to do that. You can help us if you're on YouTube. Hit subscribe for us. And while you're there, go ahead and ring that bell that ensures you'll get notifications from us. If you're on Facebook, be sure to follow us either on Ben's personal Facebook page, Daily Wire's uh, Facebook page. And while you're there, if you'll go into your settings and turn notifications on. That keeps the algorithm from being able to block our stuff from getting, it, uh, from getting to you and ensures that you'll be able to see whatever it is that we do for however long they allow us to do it. Okay, so, <laughs> so now I, and I do want to get you guys' opinion on the on Memogate, because now we're going to get the, the battle of the memos and how this has all worked mm. out. So I'm going to give my very brief take here, because I think everybody is prejudging the evidence before it's in, and no it's question. making me absolutely no insane. No. So number one, I think that it is pretty obvious that the FBI had been corrupted by Obama and by Hillary with regard to the Hillary investigation. Mm -hmm. right? I think that it's pretty obvious that, that James Comey and members of the FBI were going to find her, they were going to exonerate her, but we knew that from literally the day that James Comey announced that he was not going to recommend any sort of prosecution of her because he actually changed the verbiage of the law right. in order to let her off. I mean, I pointed this out the day that it happened because as a lawyer, I'm looking at the statute and going, there's nothing in here that says you have to have intent, right? And he was actually adding an element to the law to get her off. So it's pretty obvious that something was going on there. But the leap from there to the Trump-Russia collusion investigation is itself fatally flawed. By the way, I don't think Trump colluded with Russia, but the leap to the investigation itself is fatally flawed and corrupt, I think is a pretty major leap, even if you think that the FISA warrant was based for, for Carter Page, the, the Trump foreign policy advisor, was based on the Russian dossier. Carter Page had a FISA warrant against him in like 2014. The guy's dirty, and he's been dirty for a long time. And so the idea that we're going to jump from memo gate, that we're going to jump from, from Devin Nunes' memo about intelligence community bias to shut down the Mueller investigation, that's a leap that I don't actually see, and until we actually see the memo, we're not going to know. On the other hand, the Democrats saying that it's the worst thing ever to write this memo, and we're all going to die, and yeah. it's, it's traitorous, <laughs> yeah. and, and the, no one can question the FBI, and all this, that seems over the top to me as well, but the, the pitch and tenor have gone so high Hold the fort. Bernie Sanders is in the chamber. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the man who could be president, the, the man, man who could be there's still one so wheel away. So much pudding, ah, bring him pudding. Yeah, it's, we we have uh, we have Democrats entering uh, the chamber right now, getting ready for the president's speech. What if they um, throw tomatoes at Trump when he walks in? It would be the greatest television <laughs> since our election night coverage with featuring I mean, Ben laughing. It, it's, 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 all, it's all reality TV, so can we actually do like the Japanese TV show Slippery Stairs, and he can actually come down the slippery I, stairs? I'm just, and, I'm just hoping they, the, the Democrats bring. In illegal aliens and the Republicans bring in ICE. You know? they, they, they were talking about this, yeah. I yeah. was wondering, you know, if because the, they were saying they were going to bring in these illegal aliens. Yeah. If that is the case, mustn't we arrest and deport them? Isn't anything less a mockery <laughs> of our national immigration regime? Now, Trump should actually just get a bunch of people to put walls around them. Yeah. yeah. Right? Just build a wall, the you know, Trump I, wall I, around I wanna, them. I want to answer what you were yeah, saying. Because yeah. first of all, I, I absolutely agree that there are two issues here. One is the, is the surface of it is the Hillary investigation, but the depth of it is the degree to which Barack Obama, with a supine press, turned the federal government into a Chicago-style Democrat machine. And it's, the thing about a Democrat machine is it doesn't always break the law. It's not against the law to give jobs to friends and, and uh, to sort of, you know, ice the opposition a little bit. But it is dishonorable, and it's not really the way the federal government has run in the past. And Barack Obama definitely turned the federal government into a Democrat-style urban machine while the press sat by and asked him what enchanted him most about the president. I mean, I agree, but, but do you think it's a problem? I mean, I, I do think it is a problem if the Republicans take those problems and then blow them up to encompass the Mueller investigation itself. Because no if question. they do that, I think that they are, they're actually moving into Democrat territory by taking the entire institution of the FBI well, and suggesting well, that it's so corrupt that we can't trust them about anything. Trey Gowdy, to his credit, who has backed Bob Mueller all, all yeah. along, said that the uh, Republicans are expert at taking good facts and using so much hyperbole that they ruin <laughs> Agreed. them. And Agreed. There's no, there's no question yeah. about that. I, I personally think that the way that the Russian investigation has been... I. I the Russians, the Russians had no effect on the election. Agree. They have, they have been bothering us on our elections for 
at least 20 years, that this, this whole investigation and the mistake of appointing a special counsel to investigate it. That's Trump's has, fault. You want to talk about big mistakes well, well, in the first okay, year? That was no, Trump's it's, fault. It's Trump's mishandling, no. but, but it, is, it is indeed the working out of what Hillary Clinton herself said would be horrendous if they did not accept the results of an election, and that is what it is, and I, I think that that's appalling. It doesn't mean that Mueller's not an honest guy. It doesn't mean that he's not going to find, you know, come out with an honest You could report. indict a ham sandwich. You They'll can indict get a ham sandwich. Of course. Yeah. I, I actually don't think there will be an indictment coming down. Yeah, I think not, Mueller, not I, I think Mueller will actually at the top level. come out. Right. I think that Mueller is not going to indict. I think that Mueller will, the best that he's going to do is talk about mm -hmm. how Trump has a pattern of obstruction. But having looked at the law, the chance of actually being able to indict Trump on that, we're actually in the worst available scenario, which is going to be Democrats use whatever Mueller comes up with as right. grounds for impeachment and Republicans defend whatever Trump did in order to defend him against the impeachment. <laughs> oh, he's right. always the most cheerful person in the No, world. because I think that that's where this is going, right? We've gotten to the point where we will defend everything that Trump does. And this is, yeah. a, a, because I think you can do both things. You can say, Trump did a bunch of stupid things he shouldn't have done. And also, this is not impeachable. You know, which one, I of think my favorite exactly right. one of my favorite websites is the Babylon Bee, yes. which is a satire yeah, site for, right. uh, for so evangelicals. And so they, had a, they had a story about major evangelical leaders um, talking about how Trump was only dating uh, porn stars <laughs> a, a, as a way of sort of converting them, missionary dating. Right? Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> it's a great man, yeah. The, the problem for me with the, with the moment that we're in in history is I wasn't sure at first if it was satire. <laughs> you know, I thought we just bend like ourselves. David. Just like King yeah. David. Uh, just uh, like uh, We uh, bend ourselves into such contortions to try to make what's wrong right. And the shame of it is we're also getting a bunch of things that are good. Yeah. But, 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 but you know, I, I do think that Trump, Trump, like all of us, exists in time. And one of the things that I noticed about him... Are we sure? Yeah. <laughs> he may just be an eternal present. But, but one of I the mean, things he's nothing I, but hamburgers, but he's the healthiest person in America. Well, that's because he's never uh, wasted his life force on exercise. That's right. right. It's, that's that's right. absolutely right. That's right. Do you realize he has the Peter same Peter health Tool. theories as Gwyneth Paltrow? Peter, Peter and yet somehow Tool. this is totally fine with us. Peter said the only exercise he ever got was carrying the coffins of people who exercise, or maybe... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here we go. I think they're oh. about to announce Trump's entry oh, oh, into right. the chamber. So all get right. ready for the, the Democrats listeners. to sit and not cheer. Yeah. You think they will not as applaud? The no way they're going to applaud. No way they applaud. No way they applaud. This can't be a good look for them in the long run. Can they it? care for, for their base. They figure Trump's at 30, you know, 40 percent approval rating. They have a midterm coming up. The chances that they're yeah, actually. They haven't noticed that he's 40 percent no matter what they do, which is right. pretty impressive, actually. Well, I guess that, that Ryan's just reading stuff. So I guess yeah. Trump, that looks like Trump exiting the White House. They're still driving him oh, right. over. How do I know what the White House exit looks like? Because I am too into politics. And, <laughs> <laughs> the important you Jeremy actually team. met Mike Pence, which I, I, he's I have my, met Mike Pence. He's yeah. one of my favorite people in the administration. I, I like Mike a lot. Yeah. Yeah, he's I, I shorten that to Mench great. because I just think he's. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I mean, this is this is this is the thing that's so astonishing to me is that you know all the policy that's good that's been coming out. Yeah, you know, I give Trump full credit because he's at the top of the of the chain. Mm -hmm. But the people who are actually making the policy underneath him are the people who are actually making the policy underneath him. Like but that's Trump, always. Tr true, yeah. It, it, well, not always. I mean, the fact is that, that I think George W. Bush was a little more involved in policy than, than Trump is. I think even Reagan was more involved in policy than Trump is. Every so often you'll see Trump speak about policy in an open setting, and Kevin McCarthy has to then direct him. No, Trump You're is not a delegating guy, no question about like, it. it well, when, when, and, that, and, when he delegates, <laughs> and when he delegates, the, when he delegates, that's great, and he gets, he gets full credit for that. But I think it's mm -hmm. important for people who are his critics to recognize there are a lot of hardworking people who are around him. So even if you don't like Trump, the people around him who are trying to do the right thing for the country are actually trying to do the right thing for the country. Well, and, there are a bunch of those people. And it's important for people on our side to realize that the same thing, which is uh, a lot of the great things that you're getting out of Trump are the result of even critics of Trump. You know, the, the yes, a, a lot of our pals who were um, very vocal in their, uh, in their opposition to never Trump, which at this point, I think we should just all admit that never Trump isn't a thing. Uh, I don't it, know. It, I, it, think, it, I think there's a major stream on the right yeah. that hates this guy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in spite of all of the excellent. And, and uh, I, I, don't I, 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 I don't think there's a major. I don't think there's a major. A correct major. I don't. I don't. I don't think that's correct. I mean, because uh, let's, let's look at the list. Look at the list of the people. Of the I hate no, look at look at the list. Look at the list. Look at the list of people who are quote unquote never Trump who didn't vote for him. So I didn't vote for him in the general election, right? Jonah Goldberg didn't vote for him in general. David Crist But but. The vast majority of those people have been giving real credit where credit is due and defending him from, from stuff when he doesn't deserve it. Right? They'll hit him, but, it's, but there, there is a group, and I think it's relatively small. Right. I think you can name them, actually. Right? I think it's like Brett Stevens, Brett Stevens. Bill Crystal, mm -hmm. uh, David Frum. But isn't that the trouble? These are people you can who name have, them. They're quite prominent people. 
who were who were former leaders of the conservative the, movement. But but the but to suggest that there was this broad Never Trump movement that has continued past the election is not true. It's That's literally right. like three gods. But, but can I, Never can Trump I existed in time right, too. Because Never Trump for me, for most people who are Never Trump, yeah. Okay, Never Trump was I'm not voting for him. Once he's president, that no longer applies. I don't yeah. have a vote for him can, anymore. Can, it's can over. I, can I finish the thought though about about the fact that Trump? Trump, like he's just this thing, but like all of us, he lives in, he moves in time. He was a political neophyte. He does learn stuff. You can watch him figure stuff out. He is not the man he was when he took office. Yeah, he is I think that's under much, nonsense. Oh, he's a much smarter, much better politician than he was. He is no, mu- and he's no, and, and look, a lot of the mistakes. A lot of the mistakes he made of staffing the guys he fired. That was all at the beginning, and he started to figure stuff out. And the people that you're giving credit you're to, you're grading him on a people, curve. Yeah, it's, 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 I'm not grading him on a curve. He is a neophyte. He is unlike other other okay, presidents. Okay, the, the one thing he that I will guy, give him credit he for He is learning. a guy who stepped in out of a different business, and he has learned the business. Which he's, is what he's, he said. Okay, so so I so I agree that he has learned which levers to pull. Okay, that that that. Yeah. I, uh, but that is not the same thing as saying that he learns on the job as far as what the job comes. Is he, here's the thing. You keep going back to, and this is two different visions of the presidency, and this is where I think the fundamental disconnect is. You keep going back to, he's learning on the job. If you think that the job is purely, you sign your name on this piece of paper and X happens, or you fire this guy or hire this guy and Y happens, then I agree with you. If you think that learning on the job actually involves growing into the office, like there are a lot of us who thought, maybe there's a report the night of the election, you know, when, when I was laughing hysterically because this whole thing is incredibly absurd and, <laughs> yeah. and so funny. But, it's, but there was a report that, that Trump got the news that he'd won. And for a second, there was like a sobering moment where he realized he was president. Growing into the job, when we first talked about it, was not just he's going to learn which piece of paper to sign or he's going to learn which guy to staff at state or to listen to Mike Pence to whom to staff at state, right? Growing into the job was going to mean that he recognized, I'm now sitting in the office that was occupied by Abraham Lincoln, right? I'm now sitting in the office that was occupied by, by Ronald Reagan and, and Calvin Coolidge and great men who sat in this office and helped bring the country together. And there he hasn't learned a damn thing. I mean, look yeah. at his Twitter feed. The idea that he, the idea that he is bringing the country together. Again, I like his policies, and I can like his policies. But let's face reality here: the country is as divided or more divided than it was the night of the election. What you're saying is that his character hasn't changed. Yes. You know, somebody, somebody at, during my which is the version, part, which is the part that always bothered me. Which is right. I mean, it was, it wasn't like our, even his policies. In my version of the conversation, somebody asked me why you and I saw this differently, and I gave an answer as we do on the fly. But after, I think I saw this answer. Yeah. yeah. Well, after I went home and thought about it, I realized that. I'm a novelist. My job is to observe stuff and to look at stuff. And I've always, and we've, we've talked, you and I have talked about this a lot, is that I, I've always had a very tragic view of the world. And I've always thought, like, nations come, nations go. There's no question. There's no question that our culture is at a low. Our culture mm-hmm. has really gone downhill. And Trump is not, it, Trump has uh, not only cre- helped create that part of the product culture, of. but he is a product of that mm-hmm. culture. I, I wish you were Lincoln too. You know, I, I am sad that our culture. I only no, has to be Lincoln. I set up for the L. Our, our, I mean, like, our, our sad, I'm sad that our culture has become a fight between Jay Z and Donald Trump. That that makes me sad. But it is where we are, and in in some ways, in some ways, like it is, it is a positive. Given so, given that fact, it is a positive occurrence that a, a conservative voice has come at, out and fought the culture at who its own level. Who is a cultural figure? Yeah, himself. who is a cultural figure? But, but, and if, knows you, but if you fight the fight in the wrong way, you end up alienating a lot of the people who be your prospective allies. But and this know, is but this is the talking, problem that I have. Talking about these. You're, you're you're grading him against you're grading him against the alternative of Hillary being president, or grading him against the alternative of Jeb Bush being president. Yes. And I'm grading him against the alternative of this is the greatest opportunity, unexpected opportunity that no one expected, yeah. right? I mean, no even one, right. no one there expected. Like, I, yeah. I know people in the Trump administration, no one thought he was going to win. Okay, all of this revisionist history where they were sitting around and they had all the maps in front of them and they were playing yeah. the 40 chess. I don't believe he didn't just want not to true. win. But no, no, I, no, I agree yeah. with you. I mean, I think yeah. that, I, I don't know that he wanted to win or he didn't want to win. I think that the whole thing was started off as a lark and suddenly he finds himself in the Oval Office. I think he wanted to win. And, and yeah. I, I think he wants to win because he likes winning. I'm not yeah. sure that he wanted to win because he wanted to be president, but I think that, but that being the case, like if he could, let's put it this way, if he could put the win on his on his box and then go golfing for four years, <laughs> he which he's basically doing, that. doing that's he might be doing that's way, fine I'd be by happy me. with that yeah. too, so long as all his policies get done. But I, I think that we have to grade him against, uh, w- maybe it's early, maybe it's early, maybe you're right, maybe it's a little early for us to grade him against the opportunity lost until we know what opportunity has been lost. But I fear that an opportunity is being lost in real time and every time we have one of these moments, right, the State of the Union tonight, where he's going to come together, he says he's going to try and unify the country. Yeah. So he's going to come together. He's going to say a bunch of stuff off the teleprompter. 
I hate this whole thing, this monarchist crap, and that's really what it is. Oh, uh, State of the Union's terrible. It's such garbage. This what, idea what, that we all, what are we talking about now? This, I don't understand. The, 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 the State of the Union. The State of the Union. The State of the Union itself is monarchist garbage. This idea of the great the great king walking in and the legislative branch applauds him. Go back to sending a letter to Congress the way that George Washington did. I'd be much... I, tweet out the State of the I'll Union. I'll tell you what, I'm fine I, with you know, it. I actually but, disagree with you about this, but... but, but sorry, to finish right, the point. Okay, let's finish uh, the point. So, so when... Every time he does one of these... There are a set of headlines the next day saying, this is the day that Donald Trump became president. We've had at least five rounds of this, right? <laughs> we had this after he had his big speech in front of Congress last year, yeah. right? Which was a very good speech, yeah, right? Actually. We had it after his inauguration. We had it like, this was the moment that Donald Trump became president. And then within 24 hours, he's back to being Trump. Yeah. And if the, imagine if that moment actually happened. Imagine if he gave this speech tonight and then he didn't go on Twitter and start a bunch of fights with Jay-Z. I would be devastated. Right. Yeah, but, and this is and this yeah, is we, and, no, we, and I, but I think that you're joking, but I don't I'm think not, I'm not joking. Right, yeah. and I think that, very sad if he got off Twitter. And I think that and I think that what you are saying is the problem because I think so long as his base continues to cheer him when he does stupid crap, he's going to continue to do stupid crap, and we're going to cheer him because we're the base. But there's a whole world of people outside of us who don't cheer this stuff, who think that this, who think that this disgraces the office of the presidency. And I'm willing to take the good along with the bad so long as there's good. But there could come a point pretty quickly here. I mean, again, not to cite polls, but he, right now he's losing in polls to Bernie Sanders in 2020, 57 to 40. Okay, that's that, that's not great I, I'm, stuff. I'm skeptical of the polls. Yeah, I'm skeptical okay, of that I, I'm, kind of I'm, poll, I'm, yeah. I'm skeptical of some of these polls too because it's not an actual election cycle. He lost the popular vote by 3 million. He's going to need to win 10 million additional votes from, from 2016 to 2020 if he wants to win re-election. Bush, had to, Bush lost by 500,000 votes. He had to win 12 million additional votes to just beat John Kerry by a little bit. Right. Right, that means that... that, that Trump is going to have to do better. There's just no question he's going to have to do better unless the Democrats make the mistake of nominating again. They somehow find the, the second worst candidate in history. No, no, <laughs> they run that no, no, Hillary. They will. Yeah, yeah, they're 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 Hillary. Hillary. God, their obsession with Hillary is insane. I mean, at the Grammys, are they out of their mind? They they're must be crazy. Well, they must be crazy. Mind. She's out of her mind, and she is hitting the sauce. That's just <laughs> <laughs> Unless speaking up. Yeah, yeah exactly. She, Take a so drink. you remember after Al Gore lost uh, the presidency, after he won the presidency, after he yes, lost the presidency? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, rem <laughs> you remember the beard? Like the beard, yes. the beard, yeah, the yeah. Beard. He got fat That's and he grew right. the beard. He grew the Teddy beard. Kennedy twenty pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if Hillary could grow a beard, <laughs> like so, I'm you not know, if, she, if she's hitting the sauce, <laughs> I'm just saying if she's oh, hitting the oh, sauce. Oh, 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 I know, I know. I, I, I don't like having pity for Hillary, but uh, you know, she's it, my fourth cousin once removed, so I feel a familial bond to her. But <laughs> oh, so she's really going off the deep. Breaking news: The White House is announcing that they are going to have Trump. I like this. He's going to reverse Obama's executive order to close the detention center in the State of the Union. Um, so he's, is a, yeah, he's going to reopen Gitmo, oh, which never closed, which by never the way. Closed. Which never closed. <laughs> Can we get our cigars through Gitmo, or do we have to go to a Havana so before, itself? Listen, before the action starts, uh, I'm sure people want to know about the cigars, uh, because... Mm. I'm not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Michael Knowles sure. is actually wearing a smoking jacket, and, uh, and yeah, the, the, the we've got zero is questions Knowles's wedding night bubbles. outfit yeah. without a sound pants. <laughs> Don't be it for Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we are, in fact, uh, all cigar smokers at the Daily Wire, except for uh, young Mr. Shapiro, uh, who has no vices at all. No. Really, <laughs> he's insufferable. He's insufferable. <laughs> uh, but uh, Michael and I made a trip down to Slave Island last year in search of <laughs> the finest cigars. I don't mean we went down there to buy Cuban cigars. You'll hear people who say, oh, we love Cuban cigars. Mm. No, no, no. We were looking for, like, the cigars. You know, where you're, it was a uh, it was we a took a weekend just to buy cigars. We flew down on a Friday. We flew back on a Sunday. Yeah. We, all we did, virtually all we did on this whole island was go shop to shop to find the rarest cigars you can find. Right. And Michael Knowles, uh, I'm smoking my favorite cigar, Monte Cristo Añejado. This is a, an aged, uh, delicious cigar. I think we have Churchill size. Uh, Churchill size. I think uh, Drew is, is smoking the Romeo uh, Wide Churchill, which is a, a wonderful cigar. But the cigar of the night belongs to Michael Knowles, and it's because it is the Donald Trump of cigars. This is the Donald Trump of cigars. I was very pleased that we got this. This is the Bahique uh, 56. This is the, to the top of the line of the top of the line of Cohiba, which is the premier brand. So it costs you 120 bucks, but it's only worth 50. This, yeah, well, I, <laughs> it is, well, there is something about this cigar. It is oversized. 
like some say our president is. It's, uh, its market value is somewhat volatile. It is uh, known for its yellow and shiny top. And it exclusively eats at KFC. It exclusively eats at KFC. And, and it it's respected by dictators. So. <laughs> dictators love that cigar. Yeah, that's right. Well, which is very good for our country and the cigars. The thing about listening to Knowles talk about cigars is it'll make the State of the Union sound really interesting. Like, <laughs> oh, I totally agree. <laughs> I love it. Is, it, it is Trump great. You can see, yeah, we've. That humidor is almost exclusively stacked with uh, with our Cuban. That's basically bounty. yeah. That's the bounty from Cuba. We're in, this is the uh, executive offices here at the uh, at Daily Wire headquarters. So we keep all of our cigars on proud display. By now, we, we mean this is Jeremy's personal. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's nice thing about being the guy. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny because I shoot my show from the broom closet of the Ben Shapiro show. <laughs> <laughs> and then I look around. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty swanky. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like, we gotta change him every so uh, often uh, for an evening. As a man in, who lives in Los Angeles, I just want to ask you guys two questions. One, is it true that they roll the cigars on the thighs of virgins? And two, what's a virgin? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 so we're just waiting at this point for uh, for the president to enter. The speech is supposed to begin in about five minutes. That means that he's going to come in, and then it'll be. Uh, I'm I really am fascinated to see too, yeah. who charges down for the photo with him. Like all the people in battleground districts, usually this is the way that it works. They sit everybody in a battleground district next to the aisle so they can get pictures with the president as he walks in, and then they can send that to all their constituents. The chances that any Democrat does that are below zero. Right, right. right? I mean, much better chance that one of them has a like a coconut cream pie, like a Marx <laughs> Brothers film, and just plasters it in his face. I mean, what are the so we we should do some prop bets here? I mean, like, what are the odds that someone shouts "you lie" or, or just shouts in the middle of the speech? I chance that someone I shouts think, in the middle of the speech. I think that the people that they've brought in, uh, first of all, some of the uh, uh, con congressional black caucus are. Boycotting the speech, I think they're spending. I mean, with Louis Farrakhan, exactly. Because yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. they don't want to be with a bigot, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so was, I mean, the question is, how far after the speech is Bernie Sanders giving his? Because it takes him at least a year to toddle out of this. Out of this call, <laughs> correct? Do you think? Here's a question I want to ask: When when Trump arrived in Davos. Mm -hmm. I'm not usually surprised by anything, but I was really surprised, startled mm -hmm. by the absolute awe with which he was greeted by these people who are supposed to have lost all respect for America. Everybody stopped cold. And I can't help but wonder if there's something about Trump, there's some yes. star quality about Trump that overrides yeah. a lot of the because stuff that they're the all now, talk about. Because all these Richie Riches at Davos are now thinking, maybe I could be president of the United States. <laughs> uh, but I, I, actually, I actually think there's some truth to that. I mean, they treated him more like a reality TV star than they did like the president. Uh -huh. yeah. Like, if, like if, Norm, if Bush had come, they would just be like, oh, that's the president. He's, right. I, I have to negotiate with him. Yeah. But Trump is such a, I mean, he, no one in the history of mankind has received, has been the center of attention like Donald Trump is the no, center of attention. No, he's larger right? than life. No, no question. question. He, no. He's larger than life, and the cameras have made him even larger than that. Mm -hmm. And so all these Plus guys... burgers, I think. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> they, 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 as, as I said, I mean, the, the greatest case against Trump-Russia collusion is the only thing Trump would possibly collude with is the management of Burger King. <laughs> like, that's that, that, that really... Like, he, he just, the idea of Trump sitting there and actively figuring out a campaign plan to funnel information from the Kremlin exactly. to him, exactly. like he's got a secret closet at headquarters and he's talking with Putin. It's just, it's the most absurd theory yeah, of all time. Ridiculous. But it's but okay. So now we're getting uh, the first uh, lady is Melania. Melania. Oh, she's wearing with the pantsuit, uh, uh, the, the white pantsuit. Okay, so now this, this, this the is where speech. Alicia's in the other room gushing over the. Okay. Ah, oh, there clapping. it is. There now we are. can hear it. Yeah. Uh, excellent. I really wish okay, that nobody make a Stormy Daniels reference, guys. Don't do it. <laughs> well, I'm glad. Definitely don't do it. I'm glad they showed. They're trying to make a big deal out of that Stormy Daniels thing. I, it did have me worried that she was going to run away or something. Yeah. If we lose Melania, we lose the whole thing. I know. I, know. I love she, her. She is I, great. Yeah. She, okay, I, I, the I, chances I, of her running away <laughs> from this marriage, are you kidding me? Yeah. And I she, mean, she, I, I, point she, to, you know, they always talk about Trump being honest. She's done a great job, I think. She, it, you know, she's, okay, she's, I, I'm right. not going to talk about the job that first ladies do, which is to literally stand there and not look terrible. That's literally <laughs> their job. There are several who have failed their yeah, job exactly. in recent years. Yeah, exactly. And then to run for president. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah that's right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> But, it, but yeah, the, the, my, my favorite thing about Melania is that interview where they asked her if, if Trump would be with her if she weren't beautiful, and she said, would I be with him if you weren't rich? Yes, it's just spectacular. We don't know if that actually she happened. She for sure said that. Come on. <laughs> oh, here we go. All right. Okay. I want Steve Mnuchin to bring out his wife, and they'll just be holding the dollars as they walk <laughs> oh, out. I loved it. It's so spectacular. Rex Tillerson, who doesn't know where he is. There's Steve Mnuchin. There's General Mattis, who's taking a break from eating, from flossing his teeth with barbed wire <laughs> for the evening. <laughs> I, I sense a certain cynicism in this room. Yeah. No, no, no. There's, no, a, no. You there's Attorney General Jeff Sessions who's been let out of his cage for the evening by the president. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Steve Mnuchin, fresh from producing the latest 
smash hit Justice League. <laughs> oh, I liked, I liked it. <laughs> there he I is. Do, I do want to take this moment uh, to say, uh, if you are not a subscriber to The Daily Wire and you want this kind of rousing intellectual uh, <laughs> simulation on a daily basis, uh, head over to dailywire.com for only $9.99. You can get your very own leftist tears, hot or cold tumbler. Mm. You get The uh, Daily Show from Michael Knowles, The Daily Show from Andrew Clavin, The Daily Show from Ben Shapiro. If, by contrast, you're simply looking for a great place to ash your delicious Monte Cristo on your hollow, <laughs> head over to Louder with Crowder mm -hmm. and become a member of the Mug Club. That is the best one I've ever used. <laughs> it is a terrific it's mug. Really good. It holds my ashes very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's exactly right. Yeah. A little bit cremate you when I already put you. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, a Crowder mug with Knowles' ashes in it. I, that's maybe the pinnacle. What is that? Yeah, what is that? <laughs> if you uh, said this in front of Steven Crowder, he would hold a 72-hour mug club <laughs> telephone. And if he gets to 500 yeah. subscribers, he will personally cremate. There'll be a Michael Shantolo on the wall. I'd be running like Bugs Bunny or something. I'm not going to plant that idea with crap uh, or anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's outside with a match. Yeah. Right? <laughs> okay, so yeah, we've got the rest of the... Now, here are all the cabinet officers. You have no idea who they are. No. There's Betsy DeVos. There's oh, a, there we go. Oh, there's Rick, Rick Perry. Perry. Rick Perry, Rick baby. Perry. A man who, if he had any brains, actually would be president. Vladimir Perry. <laughs> <laughs> Vladimir Perry, who was president of the Republic of Texas uh, for there's 30 a, years. There is there's my spirit animal, Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley, yeah, I love oh, Nikki She's Haley. spectacular. Oh, man. I love Rick Perry, though. Oh, Rick Perry's pretty great. <laughs> he's terrific. Betsy DeVos has taken it on the chin, and she's been terrific as well. Yeah, she's great education. Job. I've begun to feel, I keep making these jokes about Nikki Haley at the UN being like SM porn. Like I know. this beautiful woman slap around. <laughs> I, I, I can't watch. I, I, I can't feel talk about I guilty about that. Either. So I know sweet little Lisa's watching tonight, yeah. so I can't make any comments on Nikki Haley. But you'll probably see my smoking She could be president. She could be the first female president. She's, she's oh, yeah. terrific. She's terrific. And, and, and she's taken this like this smear from the wolf oh, implication. Oh, it's just great. So that, what, that's trash. She's that been, she's been great. Well, that, that's, that just shows how garbage this whole this whole left-wing push on Me Too has been. It's, it's all uh, politicized. If they really cared about this stuff, they wouldn't yeah. be smearing Nikki Haley. That's, really that's gross. Exactly really right. gross. Uh, so we're all just waiting, obviously, for the arrival of the president of the United States. And we'll see if... Uh, I want Jets and Sharks. I want like a full-on dance fight in the middle of the in the middle of Congress, like Kanings in the center, and it'd be like pre-Civil War. There's Mattis, who single-handedly killed every ISIS. <laughs> exactly. That, that's exactly. I right. wonder when he, he has the greatest lines in America. He does. Just, does he not? Does yeah. he write them, or do they just? Oh no, he's, he's meditating. I mean, so there, there there are a few of them where they, they come out spontaneously, but there I would I, he's got to write them, right? I mean, there's no way. The guy's way. read like seven thousand books. Right? Yeah, yeah, he, he, reads, he right. reads a lot. He is one of those great soldiers who that's actually right. reads and knows. Right, when you average the number of books that he and Trump have read together, it's 3,500 <laughs> each on average. So, that's, <laughs> so this is a true story. I, I had the privilege of hosting our president not long you after did. he announced that's right. for the presidency. That's right. And he came out to L.A. and spoke, very gracious, uh, spoke to a group that I, uh, that I uh, ran at the time. And he actually said during his speech, I'm the only guy in America who's written more books than I've read. <laughs> <laughs> the truer words. You know? Well, he has read one book that I didn't write, actually. He has, we do know this at least. That's what true. is it? What is he it? Has read, yeah. <laughs> no, really, I'm curious. I'm seriously curious. He, Reasons to vote for Democrats. 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 No, no, what's, the, what's the one besides the one that you didn't? Yeah, well, I she, didn't write it. That's, that is. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah. Too subtle. Too subtle. Right. There's a joke without yeah, comment. English grammar. Without content, right, yeah. right there. Okay, so, and now Paul Ryan looking awkward as he as he <laughs> as, <laughs> as he always does. As he always, as he always does. does. And, uh, am, I, am I the last person in America who likes Paul Ryan? Oh, no, I, I like, like Paul Ryan. Ryan. Yeah, yeah, everybody right. likes Paul Ryan. Oh, but the other like, really making us like listen, Paul Ryan. Every, every, everybody <laughs> likes Paul Ryan in the same way they like Alfalfa and the Little Rascals. <laughs> I like Paul Ryan. I think he's in the wrong job, and I feel sorry for him. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. He was in his yeah. dream job, um, and he was in the job that I dream of him having. Mm. And our party went into disarray, yeah, that's, that's and he saw himself as the only guy who could save That's actually right. And then there's Ben Carson, a man who the president once suggested was an insane person who stabs people randomly. <laughs> and a child molester. Wasn't he a child molester? Right, yeah. yeah, he, he did suggest that he was a child, child abuser, child You know, we were, we were bemoaning. Yeah, you have to love was, that about America. America. You have to love that about America. What the hell's going on, guys? I mean, let's just be real about this. Okay, we're sitting here, and it's 2018, and in a second, Donald Trump is going to walk out. The guy from The Apprentice is going to walk out and address us. Like, the president like Macho answer? Camacho, yeah. walking out there with two machine guns in either hand. It's going to be spectacular. I do love American politics in the sense that yeah. you can call somebody. Okay, let's see the here, here, we go. Here, here we go. They're gonna. Uh, can we hear the? Can we get some sound? Yeah. Hooray! 
S announced by Skeletor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we need a wide shot, guys. Like, this is not useful, this close-up. Yeah, really. I, I want to know what the Democrats are doing. I, I, don't, I don't care. Like, I know what Trump looks like. Muted applause from the wife. <laughs> <laughs> She's not too sure. I'm not like, sure. Let me hear the speech first. Not a single wide shot. I think they'll all clap for him walking in. He's the president. This, uh, this is the I don't know. But they hate him. That's what I mean. That's a bad, that's a bad look. It's a bad look. Yeah. No, I think I think there are some. I like James Clyburn. Some of the people who some, are actually from the CBC will not stand up for him. But they should give us a wide shot. You're right. I mean, this is this is bad camera work right here. Come on, pull back, guys. Pull back. Okay. No, they're, see, they're, no, see, they're, oh, there's some Democrats the over there yeah. sitting down. Or standing awkwardly but not clapping. Yeah. But you, that, that's the in-betweener, right? Yeah, at least yeah. Yeah. you stand, but you don't clap. Stand, stand in the middle stand of the road, you're going to get hit by a truck. And by the way, I, I keep hearing from the people who meet Trump that he's very likable in person, you know, so that maybe yeah. some of these people may actually like him I mean, more the, than they... From, from the ones who have not been reduced to smoking ashes. piles of ash <laughs> before him. Yeah, Jim Acosta did not give me that I mean, I have not Jim Acosta. See, there it is. I told you, see, the angry... Yeah, exactly. There it is. Einstein, Nothing American love more than a scold. Yeah. Than a scold. That's right. As proved by Hillary, yeah. President Hillary Clinton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Grim, There's the right Grim, honorable Grim. Louis. Louis oh, Gomer. Louis yes. Gomer. Love, love that Louis. guy. I know. There's Kevin McCarthy just trying to guard Trump from being whispered to by Chuck Schumer. <laughs> 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 yeah, a lot of Democrats sitting down, not yeah, happy. Dick Durbin giving him a uh, shake. It really is him. low not to stand for the president. It is. I agree. It's a you bad, should have stayed home. And, and it's a bad look, you know? It yeah, doesn't yeah. I, I, honestly, I hate the State of the Union address so much that any drama that's added, I'm in favor of. <laughs> <laughs> I hate this thing so much. I actually, so, I don't fault people for staying home. I love that Scalia never used to go to yeah, this thing. Yeah, I thought it was a charade, you know. The reason I like the State of the Union, though, is some people watch it, and it is the one time. You know, yeah. you, you forget. We, we forget because that, we're in that, it all that the a time. lot of people don't know what's going on. They have no For idea sure. what's going on. Donald right. Trump doesn't know yeah, what's no, going on. No, of course not. But he doesn't have to know because <laughs> he's just the president. <laughs> <laughs> what if it, uh, what if he actually does just read the memo? Like oh, the state of the union address comes up and he just oh, reads yeah. the memo. I wish dream that he would give us that kind of a performance on, yeah. tonight. Look, and I, I do love that he, he claps he for himself. himself yeah. He gives himself the clap. Oh, I didn't mean it the way it came out. <laughs> <laughs> that would that would actually be an interesting uh, biological uh, anat anatomical feat. Actually. So we're going to talk a little less and let everyone at yeah. home actually hear some right. of the president's address. I can't promise uh, that we won't mouth off a little. That's <laughs> <laughs> what we do. That's what we do. They're standing, yeah. You can't. You really no, can't see. Look how look at all these Democrats a little sitting bit right there. Row, yeah. Take you stand for the president, point. right? Yeah, exactly. I, I do. Look at. It, I love this. I love that he's like walking around clapping for himself. Like it's a campaign rally. It's fantastic. <laughs> this is what you know, this is what you gotta love about Trump. Yeah. The guy. The guy has no sense of place or time. <laughs> no. As no, you say, yeah. and it's. There's something charming about it. There is. Yeah, there it's is. like a guileless. Uh, there is yeah, a certain innocence. Really, of, I know. Yes, there is I really a weird, like it. Oh, yeah. weird innocence about it. Pelosi about him, not yeah. clapping but standing. What if he actually just starts ripping on Andy McCabe's wife in the middle of the speech? <laughs> <laughs> I'll appoint him president for life if he brings out Steve Bannon in a gimp mask. <laughs> You're too easy. You're too <laughs> yeah. That's all I ask. That's all I ask. I will say that on the day that, uh, well, uh, no, we won't say this. No, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> so There's we're going to have only get that. Yeah. We're going to have the staff pop up a little popcorn for us. Yeah, a little and, food uh, in here. Come get on. Get a little food in here, and we'll watch the speech. And uh, hope you enjoy the speech too. Be sure and uh, hit subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Follow us if you're uh, watching on Facebook. Send us a comment or a question, we'll be glad to answer them. Here's the president. Well, that was President of the United States, Donald Trump, uh, in the first State of the Union address. We are The Daily Wire. I'm Jeremy Boring, here with Michael Knowles, Andrew Clavin, Ben Shapiro. If you're watching us on Facebook, we thank you. If you're watching us on YouTube, liar. No one's watching us on YouTube. Uh, because they actually blocked us in the middle of uh, the broadcast for using the same stream that the Young Turks are also using on YouTube without being blocked. What do you do about that? Well, follow us over at uh, Facebook or 
Visit thedailywire.com, become a subscriber. Not only do you get the delightful Leftist Tears Hot or Cold Tumblr for $9.99, uh, but you can actually hear what we're saying. Now that I think about it, it makes almost no sense that I'm pitching this, because <laughs> if you're not already on one of those platforms, you aren't listening. Uh, <laughs> this is why you guys are actually the broadcasters and I'm the uh, God King. <laughs> the God King is not all knowing. <laughs> you you couldn't are. predict, for instance, that YouTube would take us down for using a publicly owned stream right. that the Young Turks is also using without any consequence. Right, right, right. right, right. There's, there's, there's no bias. There's no bias. Right. People on Facebook right. to go over to YouTube and, and hit the bell, right? Yeah, that, people should go over to uh, yeah. YouTube and hit the bell yeah. so that they can be notified when we don't have a feed. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. <laughs> go hit something. So yep. We're going to take a few questions. Uh, from the audience because we we got a good hour of talking in and then the president got one hour plus four and a half hours <laughs> uh, his speech, we want to hear from you head on over to Facebook ask a question we'll kick over to Alicia Krauss in five minutes uh, and see if we've got some answers but first I just want to go quickly around the room uh, what do we think of the speech give us a quick grade one or two uh, lines of commentary uh, what'd you think, Ben? Um, I mean, B plus the only reason it's not an A is because it's just so long uh, otherwise I <laughs> thought that it was quite good I thought that uh, whoever wrote his speech did a, did a really good job. I thought that he delivered it well. I mean, we know he can do this. He did this last year, and I thought he gave a very good speech last year. Uh, there are, the, the, the big story of the night, of course, is that Democrats, Mike Pence secretly sneaked around to the Democrat seat and put super glue on, uh, <laughs> on the actual seats because they would not get up for anything. The national anthem, for war, for, for war stories, for, for, like, for anything, for chance of USA. They would not get up because they have determined that they are the anti-Trump party. They have no actual principles or anything they stand for. They just don't like Trump. So even when Trump is making overt calls for infrastructure plans, Republicans generally hate, Democrats still won't get up and cheer for that because, like Hillary Clinton, they think they're going to run 100% anti-Trump. Obviously, the, the big moment of the night comes near the end. We'll see how many people actually saw it with the uh, North Korean refugee who holds up his crutches near the end, <laughs> uh, which is a dramatic flourish for sure. Yeah. Um, and the and again, I think that he did a very good job of, of using, you, of doing a, a, a shtick that I think that Obama did early on well and later lost, which was use uni unity lines and force the other side to take the non-unity side. So he'd right. say things like yeah. protect Americans from crime from illegal immigrants. And Democrats would boo him. And he'd say, well, let's all stand for the ability of terminal patients to be able to get drugs that they want to get at mm -hmm. the end of their lives to try and force all that. And Democrats would sit. Right? When you say unifying things and the Democrats still won't do anything, that's the art of politics. That it was really well done tonight. And yep. uh, this, this round of good headlines I expect to last. Let's see, it's 7.35 Pacific time. <laughs> so this, this will last until approximately 7.35 a.m. Pacific time tomorrow morning, at which point President Trump will tweet something and we'll be back yeah, into the news cycle. Yeah, yeah. Andrew, yeah. what do you think? I, you know, I basically agree with that. I would give him an A-plus for the first 30 minutes. After that, I don't think anybody was listening. Yeah. You know, but <laughs> but I thought, I thought you have to give him credit for the strategy of the speech. The speech was put together, maybe Stephen Miller, whoever wrote the speech, the speech was designed to call out the Democrats on on major things, not just what Ben said, but also their unwillingness to compromise on the immigration uh, policy because he was offering them stuff that his base hates. He was offering them basically citizenship for millions of uh, illegal immigrants in, in return for security at the border, and they clearly were not going to go for it. I also thought the final moments of the speech were sensational if anybody was still around. When you think back to Obama, the notion that the people of this country are the source of its, not just its strength, but also of its uh, legitimacy, that, that that had been lost for eight years with Obama. He, he really always looked down upon the people of this country. He said himself, like, I, I would like to just get the experts in a room and solve all your problems. Trump looks to us to solve the problems. That is the American mm -hmm. way. I don't know if anybody was listening to that peroration at the end, but it was, yeah. it was absolutely, that was excellent. And I just thought the strategy of the speech was great. It did go long, and I just an hour twenty minutes. It's the yeah, second think, longest speech in the last half century. I think people. It's, you can't. You can't do long. that. You yeah, can't do that. People. Right. Have, I mean, Trump should know that better than anybody, considering really? he's a hundred and forty yeah. character guy. Yeah. Like yeah. if he'd come yeah, out two eighty. If, if, yeah. if, yeah. That's true. Two eighty now. If he if he'd come out and given a twenty minute speech, he'd every, he, 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 he would win, he would never stop being elected. Yeah. yeah. Michael, right. what do you think? I am very pleased with Trump's performance of it. Uh, yeah. We're going to go do it, Alicia, <laughs> honestly. No, you know, I will say, I'm very pleased with his performance. Okay. I'm very pleased with the writing. I'm much more pleased 
with the Democrats' performance. Oh, because yeah. Because they sat down for jobs. They yep. sat down not only for low unemployment, they sat down for bla low black unemployment. Yep. They sat down for welders. I've they never seen They sat down for the for national welders. anthem. They sat down for the for national low anthem. low black for, unemployment. Low yeah. black unemployment. For the flag, they sat down because they had to. And yeah. it, it, what I, w I really think we all should give Trump or whoever wrote the speech or whatever credit because he left them no choice yeah. but to sit for every That's one right. of those. I and agree. it is it was beautiful. I agree. And... Uh, he, he did such a spectacular job, and, and they did such a, what a tone-deaf right. performance right. Uh, from people who are usually pretty good at showbiz, right? The Democrats have us beat there until we elected Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, that they think that they can sit for things, they even sat for things that are typically their issues. They yeah. sat for infrastructure, they sat for paid maternity leave, they, uh, yeah. you know, he, they sat, he, as you said, they sat for basically amnesty. Those who Donald Trump would destroy, he first makes mad. <laughs> 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 Well, now we want to hear what you have to say about the speech. We're going to kick it over to our very own designated survivor. As you know, <laughs> uh, during the State of the Union, the president picks one member of his cabinet uh, to sit outside of the blast radius of your average <laughs> nuclear warhead. We do the same. Alicia Krauss in the Daily Wire bunker. How's it going over there? Uh, pretty good. All safe over here. Jared and I are fine. We're taking questions from the audience on Facebook because, as you said, we're shut down on YouTube. But more about that later. And we have some lots of fun responses and questions from people. People really don't want to hear you guys talk about the State of the Union. They Fair want enough. to know if Michael Knowles is wearing a clip-on tie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to undo this tie yet because it's, I will say, they don't make novelty ties in like pure silk, so it's it's pretty starchy. But this was done all by my own mono. I, I I've never, tie. I have never known Michael Knowles to wear. Yeah, I watched him tie. I will, I will vouch for Knowles. No <laughs> <laughs> Seth has a, ser a little more serious question for Ben. He wants to know what kind of scotch are you drinking? Actually, it's a multi-question question. What kind of scotch are you drinking? Do you enjoy it? Is it neat or on the rocks? And is it kosher? Oh okay, yeah, you, so said, it, you it, told it, us we're gonna ask. I said this yeah, before the broadcast. I said we have to get kosher whiskey because yeah. otherwise someone will ask about it. So yes, this is kosher whiskey. I looked it up beforehand. It is Jameson's. Uh, and uh, I had Jeremy tell me how to drink it because I'm not man enough to know <laughs> on my own. So uh, Jeremy popped an ice cube in here. And, that is 18-year-old uh, sherry cask finished Jameson. How much do I like it? Well, let's just say that it was this high before <laughs> and it is this high now. So I love it. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. All right, next question is for Andrew. Andrew, Sarah wants to know, if you were President Clavin, so if this had been your State of the Union tonight, and the three men in that room plus moi in the bunker were in your cabinet, who would be in which position? <laughs> Wait, the three men here? Yes. <laughs> I would just be asking them questions. I would just be, tell me what to do. I have no idea what I'm doing so next. So what would their cabinet what positions be? be? Yeah. Uh, oh, that's it. All right, let's see. I, I would put Ben in any position where he could kill people. Because I think, <laughs> I think, I think that he would do it relentlessly and without any emotion whatsoever. <laughs> and, I, and of course, I would put Knowles in the press. Uh, he would be the press secretary. Mm. Yeah. That's Sarah, he can say nothing better than Jeremy, anyone on earth. Jeremy would be the God King because he <laughs> is the God King of the Daily Wire. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and me? They did. Uh, they did include me. I mean, oh, they, is there they any included God? you. Uh, okay, yes, I would definitely put Secretary you... of Commerce. Secretary. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say education, but I think that's better. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's because I was homeschooled, right? Exactly. I just, I yeah, just the first cut... homeschooled uh, Secretary of Education. There right. we go. My first thing would be to close it, just like Rick Perry wanted that's to right. do. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Camilla? I'd, I'd close all of the ones that Rick Perry wanted to close and half the ones that he didn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Camilla has a question for our God King. Of course, both of those are with lowercase because we're not blasphemous around here. No. <laughs> she says, Dear God King, are you concerned about the negative health effects from all that secondhand smoke on the set? <laughs> <laughs> I think that answers yeah, the question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, I fear secondhand cigarette smoke, uh, which has now killed officially more people than heterosexual AIDS. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> that should answer your question, I think. Yeah, right? I think, I think yeah. we're already so, there. Uh, you know, as I said at the beginning of the broadcast, all things in moderation. One nice thing about uh, delicious Cuban cigars is that you don't inhale the smoke. One bad thing about smoking in my office is you do inhale all of the secondhand, <laughs> uh, all of the secondhand. I get smoke. all of the cost and none of the benefit. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I worry most for Ben. The rest of us probably uh, deserve what we deserve. Do. Right. 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 I mean, <laughs> most of the harm goes to the wallet rather than to the lungs. Yeah, so that's, that's right. Okay. Margot has a question for everybody, and she wants to know: Do Ben, Andrew, and Michael like? Do everybody watch each other's shows? 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Absolutely. Now, honestly, what, though? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. no. Honestly? Honestly, no. Of course not. But, but I mean, we're lying. I thought we were lying. I'm sorry. Ben, only, ben, ben watches every second of my show to find the moment to fire me. He's <laughs> looking for the moment. I know. I'm exploring. I'm exploring. It's all about every thought is yeah. fixed upon the ring. <laughs> Jeremy is the god king of the Daily Wire, and each morning I bring an offering to his office. I actually burn a full cow in his office in the hopes that one day he'll allow me to fire Knowles, but thus far unsuccessful. Okay, so speaking of Knowles, who we all want fired, Shrewd <laughs> wants to know, is it true that if he stands in front of the mirror and repeats reasons to vote for Democrats five times that Michael Knowles will appear? That's tr it is true. You know, uh, John Podhoretz tweeted at us, actually. I don't know if you saw this on Twitter. Mm -hmm. He said, what is up with the Davenport that has fake books in it? I guess there, I didn't look at the, the books over there, but I will say this. Fake books have been very good to me. <laughs> fake books, I'm going to put a lot of my betting on fake books. And our final question for now, because we'll be doing another round of these later, Emmanuel wants to know, guys, What's up with the vegetable platter? It looks totally untouched. What's the deal? <laughs> well, that's how you know we're men. Yeah. <laughs> hey, send it over to me. I love anything with ranch dip. <laughs> oh, I will. You can have it. Yeah, I'll you can have it. Yeah. Yeah. Cigars are a vegetable, Out. aren't they? Yeah, yeah, I think they cigars are, do count as a vegetable, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Alicia, thank you. We'll see you in a bit. Yeah. So, we're uh, standing by for one of 17 and a half Democrat rebuttals. Oh yeah, uh, to the speech, and I think that it's fair. Do we do we know which do we ones have, we're going to watch? We have a preview of Joe Kennedy's. We may have a preview of Joe Kennedy's. Did we did we pull the preview for for Joe Kennedy's speech? Okay. Well, if we do, yeah. then we'll bring that up shortly. This is so Joe Kennedy to the, the third. Daily Wire. It is to the Daily Wire. So Joe yeah. Kennedy the third. Yeah, here, here, we yeah, have a preview okay. of that actual rebuttal. So here it is. Those can be the difference between guilt and innocence. Those can be the difference between <laughs> guilt and innocence. Those would be the difference. Well, there's the, there it is. There, there's the preview of the Joe Kennedy the in third the, in the family tradition. Rebuttal yeah. speech. Yeah. Well, one of the things I love about America is that anyone can be president if your last name is Kennedy, Clinton, Obama, or Trump. <laughs> and boy, if, if your last name is one of those things, That's then you true. are you great. Grow up what I love is that the Democrats are like, we need a fresh face. Just anywhere, a fresh face. You know, something we've never. Joe Kennedy the third. That's where we're going. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, Ben, there's there's a curse for the State of the Union response. No one's ever given a good one yep. either party. And who better to break a curse than a member <laughs> of the Kennedy <laughs> family? Oh, 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 that's not nice. Oh, there he is, there stepping is. up. We know he's good at politics because his last name's Kennedy. Yeah. Boy, he looks uh, awful. Yeah. yeah. You remember that? You remember the Kennedy Nixon debate? He learned all the wrong lessons. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah something tells we me the milkman was a Nixon. Should we listen to Mayor Quimby that's or? Right. Uh, Carry on that rich legacy. Speaking in a warehouse in front of a cop. Yeah. Stage is these guys. All over yeah. Massachusetts, isn't that where Lizzie Borden Like many American them? hometowns, <laughs> Fall River has faced its share of storms. But the people Lizzie here Borden. are tough. Yeah. They fight for each other. They pull for their city. It is a fitting place to gather as our nation reflects on the state of our union. Okay, he stinks, so we, can, we don't even have to watch yeah, this. Yeah. This is terrible. <laughs> we can be quiet this yeah. fellow. He's, he's, he's actually garbage. Fast. He's really bad at this. Anxious. I really feel like the vast majority of people are tuning in to hear us not talk about the state of the yeah. union. Yeah, yeah, let's, yeah, let's not do that. Yeah. Here we are. Alrighty. Hey guys, kill him. Yeah. yeah we well, hey, 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 let's not be shy about Kennedy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa, whoa. whoa, whoa. Just just that was broadcasting talk, folks. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he did not mean that in any little fashion, guys. Wow. Ouch. Got to be careful. Man. So, I do love that. I, I love the Democrats' intersectionality routine. You know what? It's the year of the women. It's the year of black people. It's the year of Hispanics. <laughs> Joe Bring Kennedy. on the white guy. Bring in the, the whitest, whitest white human guy that has ever lived. And what is with the drool on the side of his mouth? I mean, I know. Like Kennedy Kennedy Ross, I mean. I mean, you know, Marco <laughs> Rubio got like killed for drinking water. This guy's drooling. In fairness, well, I mean, he doesn't I'm, have Jess to kind of make him look pretty like we well, do. Uh, also, yeah. I mean, Marco Rubio got killed for drinking water. If a Kennedy drank water, it would be the first time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> the water of life. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. This isn't water? Yeah. Yeah. So he's just... He's just going to keep on going here, and we'll just make fun of him. So that'll, that'll yeah. be a party. The Democrat, right. but but what a thankless job any State of the Union. Yeah, right? that's true. Horrible job to do the rebuttal. I, I feel like the Republicans should never do a rebuttal. Just yield the time back yeah. to the gentleman from wherever, wherever. But especially tonight, when the yeah, Democrats exactly. basically abstained from the speech. Yeah. They couldn't even support their own ideas when uttered by the president. But, What's a guy like but this? But you know, the, the problem with the Democrats now is that 
the way they sat down for jobs, for yeah. America, for the flag, that actually represents a, a large swath of the Democrat Party. It's not an accident. It is not an accident. They don't stand for the flag. They don't stand, you know, people have been tweeting, oh, blacks have, you know, have jobs. So what? Donald Trump said something, in, you know, about Charlottesville. You know, they, they actually don't stand for the real things that make people's lives. They stand for the state of the government and the state of a kind of a show business version of, of governance. Well, they have hinted themselves in a corner with all the intersectionality nonsense. Yeah. So by, yeah. by having all of these folks like Colin Kaepernick kneel and then saying, well, we stand with the people who kneel because this country is garbage yeah, yeah. Uh, or it has been garbage historically. Mm, yeah. It puts them in a position where next time somebody says, we stand for the flag, they now have to not stand for the it's, flag. It's so they, they had to, Trump forced them to, it was smart. He, he forced them to pick sides with Kaepernick as opposed to playing the middle position, yep. which is Kaepernick has the right to do what he's doing, but I disagree with right. him. Right. So when he says, we stand with the flag, what they really should have done is stood up and then later they should have said, listen, we all stand for the flag, but if somebody wants to not stand for the flag, they're all, but they couldn't do that because no. they'd be alienating their own base. This is what I was saying about, I think that the Democratic Party is falling into the trap now of just being anti-Trump. Now, that could work in elections, right? It worked for Republicans. In 2010, Republicans basically ran anti-Obama and they swept. So it's quite possible that in 2018, Democrats just run anti-Trump because the truth is, as much as we talk about the State of the Union, okay, let's put it this way. The bleep hole comments controversy happened a grand total of 17 days ago. Okay, that's how fast the news cycle is right now. The government shutdown ended a week ago. Yeah. A week ago. And okay, we don't remember any of that. So the state of the, the idea of the State yeah. of the Union I, is I, gonna carry I, forward I, for nine I, months. I, I worry e about this. I worry about this because I'm watching in Britain. I was in, I happened to be in Britain when Jeremy Corbyn was elected the head of the Labor Party. And this guy is a left-wing, Jew-hating piece of garbage. He's a terrible, yeah. terrible person. And they basically, the headlines were, the Labor Party has destroyed itself. And I said at the time, no, they haven't because every election is a binary choice. And eventually, this guy's gonna come up against an unpopular popular uh, con conservative government right. and Jeremy Corbyn could be prime minister and that is now what they're facing and so guys like Bernie Sanders who basically promote the Soviet Union's yeah. uh, the, point the of vacation. view they could actually they could actually win elections this is what's scary if, this is this is why Trump's popularity rating actually does matter it does matter you're right no you're right and and I think the only thing I would say about Trump is that he has laid a bet that we haven't quite seen on changing the game he is actually trying to change the whole uh, tenor on which we discuss these topics. And I'm not sure that the polls reflect whether or not he's won. I'm not saying he's won, but I'm yeah. not sure they reflect whether he's so won. I, I think that it's reflected that, I'm not sure that he's won the bet, but again, you're right that it's a binary race. So he's, I, I think his bet is that Democrats are gonna be so dumb yep. that they nominate somebody terrible in 2020, which is a significant possibility. Very possible, I mean, it's, yeah. it's very possible. If they nominate somebody like Joe Biden though, it's gonna be rough. If they nominate even somebody like Bernie Sanders, Bernie's been through the ring already, remember. Mm -hmm. You can hit Bernie with a lot of stuff, but Bernie was hit with a lot of stuff by Hillary Clinton with the Democrat base. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I, I think that Trump would go right at Bernie, but I'm not sure Bernie doesn't go right at Trump. So it's, it, I just think that we, are, uh, I remember after 2004, after Bush won re-election, I wrote a column where I thought Republicans are never gonna lose again. I mean, I, we've won three straight elections, won 2000, won 2002. He won re-election in 2004, even though he lost the popular vote in 2000. I figured we're on a roll. This, is, this could be a, an era of dominance for Republicans. And I get the same feeling among a lot of Republicans now who just, they, they, they want it to be true. Win. It's like, we're never gonna lose again. Well, yeah. Democrats until five minutes ago thought the same thing, that they were never gonna lose again. Mm -hmm. And that's just not the way that, that's, that that's politics works. works. You're absolutely right. But it yeah. does get to my s central theory of the left, which is that they, they want the, the appearance of the thing but not the essence of the thing. Mm. So yeah. they want to look, they want a president who looks like a president. Oh, Barack Obama, he talked like a good president. <laughs> he, the Kennedys, they look like good, but they aren't the husk of the thing. And, and what's unfortunate, <laughs> a little bit for us sometimes, is Donald Trump doesn't look like the president. Yeah. He doesn't talk like the president, he doesn't behave like the president. But he is governing like the president. And that, that's a real dichotomy. I've never seen it so clearly in American politics. And I don't know which way we're gonna go. It's well, a superficial I, culture, so. The, the fact that, we, I think that the way we're gonna go is the way we don't want to go because we're getting precisely the reverse of what you would think. Meaning that Trump is a visual president, right? He was the guy who was a reality TV star. He had no yeah. experience in politics. He wasn't the guy, he wasn't Paul Ryan. He wasn't a substance guy. Trump is proof positive that Americans want the image of something. Whether that's the image of the president or whether it's the image of just imagery, yeah. Yeah. they want the image. And so the question is less image over substance than which image do Americans want? Mm. And in that moment yep. in 2016, what they really, I, I still believe that the 2016 election, we give Trump all sorts of props and he, he deserves props for visiting states that people like, uh, like me thought he was a fool to spend time in Wisconsin and, and Michigan, I mean, or Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, but, yeah. Pennsylvania. But 
w but that election to me was still about the awfulness of Hillary Clinton much more than it was about the quality of Donald Trump as a candidate because Hillary Clinton did not pull in flies. She could not get flies. I mean, it was, and, and she, there's a reason. Did you no. see that during the State of the Union, she released a huge Facebook statement? Literally, no. during the State of the Union, she released a huge Facebook statement about how it was wrong of her to have not fired that guy for sexually harassing the help. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. she released that. I mean, mind. ultimate Poor document Trump. Just doing <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, 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 you know, you, can t you can't, I, I, I agree with you that image means so much in this age of media and as it has since Nixon Kennedy. But you, you, reality does get a vote. You can't, like, exclude the fact that the economy is better, that people do have jobs, and people know when they have jobs, you know? It's not like, you can, you can have the, you, you can have the media know. telling yeah. you that, oh, the Obama economy was great, but people knew it wasn't. And wages are going up, and bonuses are going up, and jobs but, are going up, and I think that's gonna have an effect. The wages are important. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't wanna be the, the, the pessimist in the room, but that is my designated <laughs> yeah, job. Exactly. I, mean, that's, I don't wanna be, what do you mean, what what do you, mean you don't wanna be? That's like, you don't wanna be I don't wanna be Ben Shapiro. I was born this way, in the words of a famous thinker. <laughs> but, but, here, but here's the here's the thing about the way the economy affects elections, in my opinion. Uh, a bad economy will kill a president. A good economy doesn't necessarily save one. Right. So in 1992, yeah. the economy was already recovering by the time H.W. ran for re-election, and he lost. In 2012, the economy was recovering, but it wasn't that great, and Obama won. In 1980, the economy sucked, so Carter lost. But a good economy is not a guarantee that you mm. actually win re-election. Yeah. So, True. look, does it yeah. help? Yes. But... The, the economy is also a precarious thing, and, and I can't shake the feeling, maybe it's just a feeling, because I'm not looking at the underlying fundamentals when I say this. Every eight to 10 years in the country, there's some sort of recession, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it happened in 2000, it happened in 2008, yeah. which means part of we're kind of overdue, right? Which means it's 2018. So maybe this lasts another four years, or maybe we go another two years and an economic crisis but, hits but a different direction, we don't I, know. So if we're betting on just that, then I didn't mean it's, to limit it to the economy, I meant reality in general. I mean, one of the things that Trump does that for me is an incredible relief after eight years of Obama lecturing us and telling us that's not who we are, as if we are somehow better than other people. We're not, our ideas are better than other people, but we are just people. To have Trump basically laud this country, laud the people of America, laud our history, laud our traditions. I agree with this. I, I think that this is an important thing, and I, I did have this experience when I was in New York over Christmas of people looking me in the eye and aggressively in New York mm -hmm. wishing me Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. You know, and <laughs> well, I just, well, I just, well, it has. And look, in right wing in right wing circles, this stuff has become sort of an in joke and a password. But I think that what you are right about more than the Merry Christmas stuff is the idea that, and Trump said it, and he was right that the president is given all sorts of credit when the economy is good and given all sorts of, of yeah. blame when the economy is bad. It's really nonsense. The truth is that the president usually has very little to do with the economic status of the country. It's usually a delayed effect for three or four years. I mean, the idea that you're gonna attribute like Clinton's growth to not Reagan and Bush, yeah, but just yeah, yeah. to Clinton, no, I, I, is just I, silly. I, yeah. but, the, but that's not a rip on Trump. What it is saying is when Trump said that America needs a cheerleader, one of the things that the president can do that's effective is he can make business people feel comfortable. And this is one thing Trump has done really well. What the, what the business community wants, even more than the tax cuts, because the economy is growing before the tax cuts, one of the things the business community feels like is, at least we know he's not gonna clock us across the face right. from some direction we don't know. But right? With Obama, any minute you felt like he could take the regulatory and, and state the people, and hit you with a brick. And the people feel this too. The people are tired of, of having us apologize for what is, after all, the engine of democracy. What is still, this country is still the only reason any human being who is well, that's why the North free. Korean section worked so well tonight yeah, in this speech. Yeah, but there, but there, I, yeah. I want to challenge, uh, I typically agree with Ben on these questions, but uh, while I agree that historically economic trends take a long time, we have seen something in this presidency which is an immediate response. Yeah. Immediately upon his election, the stock market began to surge. Immediately upon the passage consumer of tax, confidence. Uh, of, yeah. yeah, consumer confidence, immediately upon passage of the tax cuts, uh, companies started announcing that they would repatriate funds into the country. The IMF companies started, started giving to bonuses to their employees. This is, uh, in other words, there, there is... Um, There's a difference in kind you're, you're sort of suggesting. Well, I, what I'm suggesting is that the economy is playing politics right now in a way that we have not historically so seen. So I, I agree with that in part. I, yep. I think that it'd be a mistake to attribute the entire stock market surge to Trump because I was there when Obama was president, it wasn't that long ago, and we were saying, yes, the economy, the, the, look, when, this, when Obama took over, the stock market was at 9,000. Yep. When he left, the stock market was at 17. Right, right. So, the, right. so for us to sit around and go, well, the stock market only grew under Trump is obviously not true. No, but not to right. Jeremy's um, point, but, some of it, discrete things. The IMF said tax reform helped. We know some money's coming back. Some right. things you can attribute so the, to Trump. So yeah, I, I think the biggest thing that you can attribute to Trump is not even the tax cuts. Well, we'll see the effects over the coming years. I think that what's happening now is the companies are getting smart. And what they're doing is they're saying to their employees, look, economic policies matter. 
And so it's not that Apple saw a giant infusion of cash immediately enter their, their coffers That's right. as soon as the tax cut went through. It was them saying to their workers, listen, tax cuts are good for us, and over the next couple of years, we're going to feel it. So here's a $1,000 check now. So you link the two things, right? We're not going to wait for the company to grow over the next two years, and then you'll have to sort of intuit yeah, and, and that something good happens. So they that's, did not that's trust smart. Obama. They, knew, they kept their money This offshore, is the big thing, right. And this it's is, a huge deal that all this money is going to come back. Trump is right about this. He has basically said, hey, we're open for business, and, and businessmen <laughs> like that. They like us being open for I business. Mean, this is, this is the the they don't want to be in other countries. Taxes, this is a good country. Even right. high taxes are survivable if there's tax stability. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the right. problem that's during right. the Obama and, era, and, and regula especially through regulation, yeah, yeah. especially with regulations, people yeah. had no idea what was going to happen. Well, this everything. is why I think that, you know, the economy, barring some sort of exigent circumstance, it should remain decent so long as Trump doesn't cater to the middle. Now, this is what's, this is what's interesting. What we saw tonight is actually the best indicator that Trump is going to have to remain in the conservative circle. Right, so one of the things that I think I feared, I know Jeremy feared, was I, that, you, know, that you feared too, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. If Trump is president and the Democrats take over Congress, he tacks to the center, right? He right. starts to triangulate and he starts to try to cut deals with Democrats. It ain't happening because the Democrats because won't have it. Him. It's not they about Trump, right? Yeah. You saw that tonight. He offered a couple of things the Democrats have been hungry for, right? $1.5 trillion in infrastructure spending. Yeah. And the Democrats are sitting on their hands. Right. right? He's talking about legalizing 2 yeah. million illegal immigrants and bringing 4 million additional, right? The, he didn't even talk about the legal immigrants that are coming in. Right. He said he's going to end chain migration. Mark Krikorian is spitting mad because Mark Krikorian of the Center for Immigration Studies, he says, yeah, the problem is when he says he's going to end chain migration, everybody who's currently on the chain migration waiting list gets in. Right. Okay, so the Tom Cotton plan originally cut off the chain migration waiting list at people who are on the list for the next year, but everybody else has to pull their fund, they get their money back and their, and their applications go away. Trump hasn't done that in his proposal. So that mm. means for 17 more years, mm. people who are on that chain migration waiting list get in. That's 4 million additional legal immigrants coming into the country. In addition Trump, to 3.6 million uh, dreamers. In addition yeah. to the dreamers. Right, in addition to the 1.8 million dreamers, which is bigger than DACA, right? Because DACA was only, like what he did That's is right. DACA only applied to the people who have actually registered with the federal government. He says he wants to do it for all the dreamers, which is people who haven't even registered with the government yet. So he's offering all of these fig, uh, all of these, uh, these, uh, these, uh, what what do you call it? Uh, uh, leaf. Uh, uh, fig leaf. Fig leaf. Uh, he's, he's offering an olive branch. An yeah. olive branch, <laughs> yeah. I'm looking for. Thank you. He's, he's offering all these olive branches to Democrats, and they're spitting in his face, which means that if they take over in 2018, it's going to be interminable investigations. We're going to get Democrats going after him on sexual harassment and sexual abuse. They're going to investigate his finances. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're going to force yeah. Ivanka and Jared to come and testify in front of Congress. They're going to do. They're going to subpoena everyone and everything. That they're going to do secretary. Well. That was not a good look for the Republicans under Clinton, though. Yeah. Well, they didn't have the media on their side either. I mean, it'll it'll mm -hmm. be interesting to see. Yeah. You know, when when the media are hammering away. And when and when Ross Perot doesn't run, right? I mean, the yeah. fact is that that Ross Perot really shivved the Republicans a couple of times in mm -hmm. '92 and '96. Yeah, that's right. If there's no third party candidate in '92 or '96, then Bill Clinton's never president. So we'll have to see what happens. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm I'm. But the good news is for the economy, Trump will not sign anything they send his way. Right. Because he's not going to cut a deal with them, right? He's not. Well, they're not going to cut a deal with them. They won't send the, anything. The entire way. offer, it seems to me, is a trap. I mean, he's making this <laughs> offer because he knows. I agree with you. Schumer has telegraphed that he will not accept it. So now he can go on Twitter. Which remember, Twitter, he did it, yeah. Twitter is like a million times what the New York Times circulation is. Trump's Twitter feed, the New York Times has a circulation 0.5% of what Trump's Twitter feed is. Yeah. He now goes on Twitter and says, hey, I offered them everything and they will not take it. I totally agree with this. This is why I was, I was kind of shocked that, that Ann Coulter, I, I understand that you know, Ann and, and Krikori and they have this to is, say what they have to say about She's immigration. Right. Tough game. But, yeah. but, but the reality is that what Trump did was not an actual offer to Democrats. That's it was right. him saying, right. I will give away the store and you guys still won't make a deal with me because you hate me so this much. This is the art of the deal. I mean, it really is kind of it's, what it's he It's said the first time good. I ever saw him do something in a negotiation where I thought, that makes sense. Because yeah. most of the time yeah. a negotiation is Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer do show guys, up and he's like, okay, go ahead. Do you guys <laughs> think, that, you think maybe that Donald Trump, since becoming president, read The Art of the Deal. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to kick it back to Alicia, see what you have to say about it. Remember, if you're watching us on Facebook, to uh, go up and hit follow so that you uh, help us get our messaging to you. And even beyond hitting follow, if you already do follow us, uh, go into your settings uh, and make sure you receive notifications from us so that we can actually uh, reach you in this age of uh, conservative censorship. And uh, Alicia, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here.
What you got? We got tons of questions, but most importantly, Edward has a question for Ben that I don't think any of us have the answer to. Ben, uh, Edward wants to know, what does your wife do for a living? <laughs> 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 yes, indeed. I've I mean, it's, it's been a long rumor, yeah. right? I mean, I, there, yeah. there have been rumors a long time. She is, she's a doctor. Wow. Whoa, no kidding. Right? You right? don't yeah. know. My, you know, my wife is a doctor is greater than John Kasich's dad is a mailman. <laughs> <laughs> <That's it. laughs> do you know the most amazing? You like, should know this, by the way. She had, Her kid was sick over yep. the weekend, and she actually texted my wife for medical yep. advice. And, so. it, and it was after sundown on Saturday, because some people tweeted that to me, and I was like, don't worry. They're good Jews. They didn't break Sabbath. Well, <laughs> if, if, if it was a life-threatening situation, she'd answer you even on the Sabbath. That's, right. That's, That's how it right. works. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was fine. And, and she's a very good doctor. I will definitely go to her, you know, once my covered California kicks in. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Nate asks of Michael, I'm going into political science as a college major. What tips do you have for me as I go into the leftist world of academia? My first one is do not major in political science. That is my first <laughs> that's, as much, of, that's as much economic advice. That's, that's, that's right. Yeah, that's certainly economic advice. Sometimes political science majors do well. Uh, Barack Obama, Ben Shapiro, people have risen to great heights doing political science. I prefer uh, history. I, I think... Political science used to be a good field. I think now they've mostly weeded out the po political philosophy aspect of it, which is the really substantive aspect of it. So my advice to you is to study the ancients. I think we would all agree with that. Uh, don't just study modern political science. You mean like the Beatles? Like the yeah. Beatles, Bob Dylan, Bob Dylan is a good one, Jay-Z. He's almost ancient at this yeah, point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Classic rock. Yeah. Study them, yeah. And, and study what would have been the classical <laughs> aspects of liberal education, too. And then, uh, and probably keep your head down and your mouth shut because you might, you might have a little bit tr of trouble in college these days if you voice your opinions. All right. Mm -hmm. Eric has a question for our God King, Jeremy Boring. God King, you seem insightful <laughs> and borderline omniscient. So do you think that well, Democrats... He's a God King, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to know, do you think that Democrats actually believe that sitting for both the anthem and God is a winning political strategy? I think that Donald Trump should have actually uh, broken into the national anthem. <laughs> And force them all to kneel. That would have been like the greatest moment. What if he had actually played the end of Dinesh's movie? With Where the, we go. Yeah, yeah, going over, going over. Over. I always wonder why don't they do like an A B State of the Union? They could do that now. Like bring down a big screen. Yeah, I think yeah. it'd be fun. Yeah. Like we could do that. Could fire people on national TV. <laughs> By the way, I, I do like this comment from Twitter. Bravo to the Democratic advanced staffer who decided to put Kennedy in front of a broken car on national TV. <laughs> <laughs> Just genius <laughs> move right there. <laughs> yeah, I do think that they. Uh, I think that they are so in their bubble of partisanship, mm -hmm. which is something that I think we have to be careful about as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a bubble? Uh, uh, what are you talking about? No. <laughs> they're, they're so deeply in that that they, I think they honestly believe that people are sitting at home slow clapping them mm -hmm. for keeping their seats. Mm -hmm. And what, they, what they're forgetting is the lessons, as I said before, they're typically so much better at media than we are, so much better at showmanship than we are, but Trump's, you know, Trump's a carnival barker from way back. He's just got their number. And so they're forgetting the things that they know. Uh, and one of those is that the momentum of, you can't compete with the momentum of the speech. Sitting the way they did is sort of like giving the rebuttal to the State of the Union. You lose automatically. The, the reason that Ben, uh, I think all of us agree that, well, not, not Drew, that this entire sort of uh, episode of the State of the Union, the president standing like a monarch in front of the uh, chambers of con assembled Congress and, and all the applause and everything, it's sort of anti-American. I mean, there's a reason none of the founders didn't do this. Jefferson uh, did away with it. It was just a speech until uh, Woodrow Wilson. Washington wrote a letter. Yeah, right. Washington wrote a letter. Woodrow Wilson decided that uh, he would give this as a speech, and it really became this sort of progressive iconography kind of uh, thing, and we've tried to embrace it. Um, uh, but the, the power of that is that it makes the executive powerful. That's what the progressive presidents wanted, was to show the power of the executive, and sitting there makes you seem inept. You're already in a situation where the president is more, where his power is on full display. Uh, and I think they were basically showing the guy their necks. I mean, I think it was a horrible yeah. miscalculation. Yeah. Well, it, it reminds me a lot of, uh, you remember during the, the Gore-Bush debate, when Bush would say something and, and Gore would sigh and hem-haw and yeah, frown, yeah. Mm -hmm. and it looked really bad and people yeah. didn't like it, it felt exactly the same. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Patrick has a question for Ben. He says, why do you hate Knowles with the burning heat of his thousand suns? <laughs> That's so Chigo. obvious. I mean, <laughs> have you seen him? He's sitting here in a smoking jacket and an American flag bow tie. What am I supposed to wear? <laughs> he sold more copies of his books than all my books combined, and there are zero words in them. 
But there are words except, by except me the one on you the wrote. cover. <laughs> Why do I hate Michael Knowles? <laughs> is, I've yeah, worked that, for that, years that, to reach success. That was and a Michael dopey Knowles, question. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a terrible <laughs> question. I hate you for asking that question. That's a terrible <laughs> question. <laughs> Randall has a question for Andrew. He says, Andrew, I'm curious because you're clearly a very productive person. What does your daily routine look like? Can you enlighten us as to your disciplined ways? Yes. Mm. First of all, there's no sleeping in my days. They, the sleeping just does not exist. I occasionally doze off like during this conversation several times. <laughs> 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 just falling completely asleep. But normally I'm just awake for 24 hours a day. I come in, I do my show, I do a lot of show prep, and then I go home and I write uh, for hours and hours on end. And then I go to bed and read constantly. And occasionally, I, I must sleep sometime. Otherwise, I'm not human. But I, I don't know when I do. So I just don't sleep. That's, that's the answer. And, and I, I'm going to say something about that. Because uh, one of the things that I love about coming to work with these three guys, there ain't much. I wanted to yeah. know. What it, one thing that is impressive about all three of you is uh, your discipline. Uh, you're all so well read. You're reading at the office constantly, having discussions ab about books that uh, don't have pictures in them. Stuff, that, <laughs> stuff that's really important to uh, a lowly god king such as myself. Uh, but even among, uh, even in this company, Andrew Clavin's work ethic and discipline uh, towers above. I mean, you, when I first met you, you said that you work basically. You structure your day in four-hour shifts, yeah. and, uh, and that's how you're able to move from project to project the way that you do and have. Yeah the kind of productivity that you have, it's pretty I, I would impressive. just like to say, Alicia, this is the only nice thing Jeremy has ever said about me. <laughs> and it was caught on camera, so I think it's... It's caught on camera. <laughs> Even if YouTube shuts us down again, we will make yeah. sure that it is taken. Just put it out Jeremy's there. Keep it in your archives forever. <laughs> 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 Douglas has a question for Ben. He wants to know, Ben, what are your thoughts on video games, and do you play any? Uh, mm -hmm. No, I, I do not play video games. I, I did for a very short period when, I was, when I was a kid. Um, but I just, honestly, sitting in front of a screen for hours at a time, why would anyone do that? <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, now, now, that, now that I'm, uh, I'm older, the, the truth is that uh, now that I have a couple of kids, they are my video game. Uh, I have, I have uh, a wife and I spend time with her in the evenings. I just don't have, I don't have time for it. What do you do for a living? You tweet. You know, I've heard I she's mean, a doctor. That's, 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 that's what I've heard. I was just curious. I was like, <laughs> a family physician. I saw some people asking what is her, what is her specialty. She's a yep. family physician. Yep. Uh, that, that's why I texted her on Saturday night because I need some family medical advice. And also a doctor of love. But I'm, but that's, that's, <laughs> oh, that's God. TMI. TMI. <laughs> Final question for this segment, guys. Uh, ben wants to know, Zach has a question for Ben. He wants to know why you consider yourself a conservative and not a libertarian. Okay, the reason I consider myself a conservative and not a libertarian is because on social issues, I really believe that there's a social fabric that is necessary uh, and, that, and that we have to spend an awful lot of time preserving. I think the, the only problem I have with libertarianism is less about governmental ideology than it is about uh, social ideology. There, there are a lot of libertarians mm -hmm. who tend to feel that, for example, religious institutions, community organizations, these things are oppressive rather than, uh, rather than building of the, of the capacity for a free and freely governed people. So when it comes to governmental policy, I call myself a libertarian, essentially. When it comes to overall worldview, I call myself a conservative because I put a lot of focus on the preservation of trust that we have in one another on a day-to-day -day level that requires social institutions that are informal and not created by government in order in order to fulfill. I, mean, I want to kick something in there, too, because it, it's tempting for us in this room to think of ourselves as libertarians. Uh, and part of that is a branding issue because the word conservative has some brand problems, right? Especially we speak to especially a young audience. Especially in L.A., yeah. Especially in L.A. Yeah. We, we all have at various times worked in the entertainment industry, and you can kind of, you get a little grace for the word libertarian. Uh, and I think that at a fundamental ideological level on policy, I tend to agree with libertarianism. I agree with the general notion uh, that basically the government's job is, to, is only to uh, protect your nose from my fist, right? That, that unless the government is keeping me from infringing upon your rights, everything else should be within my rights. Uh, where, where libertarianism has begun to lose me is as I explore its roots. To go back to Alexander Berkman and some of the early communists, they saw libertarianism as a part of their ideological movement. They saw libertarianism as fundamentally a left-wing uh, ideology. And it's, it seems shocking to us because we think in these very rigid American political terms between big government and small government. But what libertarianism is, is a utopianist philosophy. It's yeah, basically right. akin to communism, whereas the communists believe that the original sin is class. The original sin uh, is, is wealth divide. And if we could do away with that, we could sort of 
have an Edenic uh, paradise that we all live in. The libertarians believe that coercion is original sin. Mm. And I think that what makes us conservatives, the four men in this room, is that we believe that original sin is that thing that happened in the garden <laughs> where man sought to usurp God. You're yeah. here. God right. brought you libertarians. Yeah. And, the, right. and so we don't have a utopianist view. None of us believe that if the government gets smaller, the world would be perfect. That's right. None of us believe yeah. that if we outlaw abortion, we'll live in a land of... of uh, happiness and apples. Uh, none of us believe that if we just defeat North Korea, the last of our enemies will have been vanquished. We don't believe if you secure the border, the country will... We don't believe that. We believe uh, that the world can get better and the world can get worse, but only God can redeem and perfect. Well, the, the, that the, fundamentally makes us not that's, libertarian. That's absolutely that's, true. That's, that's, that's a true. really well yeah. put. Yeah. Yeah. There's, absolutely right. There, there's also uh, an aspect of, of some branches of libertarianism uh, that actually is is quite anti-founding. So if you read Albert Nock, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you ever read, if you're one of the early libertarians, a guy who was sort of an influence for William F. Buckley, uh, you know, Nock specifically talks about how the founding fathers were basically, he buys the Charles Beardian philosophy of how the country was founded. A bunch of property owners seeking to enshrine their own interests, and that's why they founded the country the way they did. And he talks about any element of state as being as being terrible. Now, I'm very anti-state when the state is doing the wrong things, but there is a purview within which the state is supposed to work. And I think that the, there's the, ar and the sort of anarcho-capitalist wing of the libertarian movement uh, yeah. that is pretty wild. I, I've said for a long time, I think a conservative libertarian merger is, is correct. Yeah. If, we, if we understand that libertarians are basically right, that the government mm -hmm. is a problem, and libertarians basically understand that conservatives are right, that that virtuous behavior is necessary. Drew, for logistical, for logistical, for logistical too, yeah. reasons, I need to hear Drew's thoughts on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think the the question is, what is the is the government's role, and what are the, is is the people's role? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's that's what it comes down to. We all believe in the family. We all believe in the structure of uh, you know of of uh, sexual restraint. We all believe in the basic yeah. conservative issues. <laughs> Never mind. Well, you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to <laughs> get married. Idea, but yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean that the government has the right to enforce those things, or has the right to, you know, uh, restrict the way individuals behave. Right. And that's that's a different thing than saying, you know, it always bothered me when the uh, when Colin Kaepernick was kneeling for the flag, everybody on ESPN said, well, he has the right to do that. And I thought, yes, but nobody's addressing the question of whether it's right yeah. to do that, which is a different question. The question he, of virtue is, is a really big one, and this is where one, I think yeah. a lot of the libertarians uh, they, miss they the boat, fall. because there's an implication that, that virtue is actually antithetical to small government, that if, if virtue exists, and they make the mistake that... No, virtue that, is the fill, pillar of small government. Right, but, yeah. but the, I think that this is something that's missed, and it's even missed among some Straussian philosophers who, who attempt to suggest that when you read Plato's Republic, and Plato is talking about his kind of utopian vision, that the minute you talk about whether human virtue is possible, does the government have to coerce you into virtue? That's right. Right, and, and the answer is no, the government doesn't have to coerce you into virtue, but in order for you to make that argument, you actually have to be virtuous on your own. Yes, and, and, and Plato did write the laws after he wrote the Republic, yep. sort of saying, you know, like, okay, we're not gonna- I was just this. joking, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Plato, I mean, by the way, this was, this, was, this, was, was, this literally yeah. was, this, this really is Strauss's read on Plato, Yeah. right? He actually, his read on Plato is that is that Plato's Republic is basically a parody of utopian philosophy with regard to building it's a, government. It's yeah. a utopia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, uh, very happy to announce that we have one guest. We, <laughs> we sought the best and the brightest in the conservative movement. They all turned us down. Uh, and, then, and then we called our friend Dennis Prager, and uh, we promised him there was a cigar. That uh, was it. That yeah, was the, it was the and, cigar and that did it. Well, that was a big factor, I have to say. What is it, actually? That is a Boulevard oh, Bella Costa Cuba. Fina, yes, you guys are brought Cuba. by our very own hands. Dennis is right. not a Cuban cigar fan. I have wagered that uh, the only Cuban cigar you would actually enjoy is this one. It's the most robust. Cuban cigar, the Bella Cosa. No, no, so far so good. And if you don't like <laughs> just it, in case. we do have a Padron, which we will oh, swap out for Just in you. case. Oh, but you wanted me to try I this. I wanted you to try this. <laughs> How are you, everybody? Good. It's good to see you. <laughs> yeah. Good to be here. Um, you you saw know the that I, uh, I welled up in tears a few times uh, during the address. Uh -oh. So did I, but that's because I'd aged so much. <laughs> oh, is that what it is? <laughs> that, that is an interesting question. So that is an interesting question. Is it my age? Or, or, uh, or is it that it was particularly heart-rending stuff? When yeah. the Korean uh, yeah, young man yeah, that waved console. the crutches, yeah. I don't know how, he was, Koreans, like most Asians, are very controlled. Yep. Yeah. They don't emote easily. He was fighting back tears that the American people were cheering him, yep. that he got to freedom. 
I don't know how you don't well up. I, I mean, if there's, there are very few times the left and right can agree. I, I think there are unbridgeable divides between them. But if that didn't move you, there is something wrong with you emotionally and morally. Yeah. Uh, the warm beers, what their, what their son suffered. Yeah. Yeah. The, the couples who lost their kids to, to the, uh, uh, the gangs. I mean, I mean, these were these were powerful uh, moments, and you know, they're all they're all fighting back tears. Maybe it happens all the time. I usually tend to read so twos mm -hmm. and uh, State of the Union addresses, and and so maybe that's why, you know, I, I think this was particularly moving. But I, so I'm asking you, was it? I, you yeah. know, I think I think it, it was. was, and I also think it's important that Trump understands the power of that. When you listen to the Democrats talk about immigration specifically, they never talk about the rule of law. They never talk about uh, the theory of w what what makes a nation a nation. They only talk about the emotion of individuals. And Trump basically yeah. plays their game right back at them. The you know, story. Say, saying, yes, here, story. here's a sad-eyed uh, immigrant, but here is also a sad-eyed person who lost a yes. child to an illegal immigrant. And how about and, and Americans touching. are dreamers, too? And that was a great, that was the line. That, line. Yeah, that's was the that line an awesome speech. line? Yeah. Well, although, think, although it didn't match Jeremy's line when the guy held up his crutches and Jeremy said, God bless us, everyone, which I thought <laughs> was possibly <laughs> <laughs> the most, the cynical, the most yeah. cynical moment, but also the funniest <laughs> moment of this movie. And profound, this is, this, is why, this is why we'll follow him anywhere. Yeah? By the way, what is this? I see your name come up on the screen. It says God King. Yeah. I, I don't have a problem with that. I just I have to understand how did that originate? Are you Pharaoh? I mean, the last yeah. God King. I'm just doing a commentary yeah. on Exodus. Yeah, it, it is a. Uh, uh, probably one of these um, be careful what you wish for sort of <laughs> yeah. I will say though that I did not anoint myself God King no. Andrew Clavin it was me I, uh, <laughs> came I up did. With God and, and, and I did mean it you know like like an ancient ruler of Egypt not like an actual God and by and the way Dennis if, if, you are here, here, Pharaoh, yeah. if you are here to free your people we've been trying to get out of here <laughs> <laughs> take so, us take us away yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, well did you hear the Kennedy response uh, the first 30 seconds of it. Okay, and then so let, me, let me tell you. It went off a bridge for me. Yeah. No, no, it's actually, <laughs> in, I, I have nothing funny to say about that speech. It was disgusting. Yeah. It was demagogic in the extreme. And we didn't hear it. What did what he say? With yeah. you, okay, I'll, I'll give you my, the worst of his all, all demagoguery speech. You build the wall, our generation will tear it down. Mm. Wow. Just what I wrote in my syndicated column today, why the left is, is forevermore immigrants. They don't believe in the nation state. Yeah. That is what this guy doesn't believe in the nation state. The left has never done it. Proletariat of the world unite. Not Germans unite, not Russians unite. Workers of the world unite as the end of the Communist Manifesto. Leftism never believed in the nation state. I'm sure you all know a Superman gave up his American citizenship in the comic strip just a few years ago. He's now a citizen of the world. That's right. This is what they awful. believe in. But we don't, our team doesn't campaign on this. We don't educate America. Please understand, this guy Kennedy represents the Democratic Party, which doesn't believe in borders. Do you understand yeah. that, Americans? That's the issue. This comes on the heels of a speech in which the Democrat, as, as we've been discussing, sat for the national anthem, sat for the flag. Who sat, sat for it? Who? Dur Everyone. If you were watching the, the State of the Union. Yeah, I did. Speech, yeah, go on. Uh, there was an applause line for the flag. Oh, they, that's right. They sat. Yes. An applause line for the anthem. They sat. An applause line for uh, American prosperity. They sat. That's they, right. They think Even that the black saying, unemployment rate is a black representative set. That was it, it, it's a moment to save her. They think they're sitting in opposition to Trump, but they're actually revealing what you're saying. That's exactly right. They don't right. believe in mm -hmm. America. They don't believe in patriotism. They don't believe well, in. I, I hope that people see that because I think we, we all in this room agree that, on that. But I think that. They don't because see the media, it. Because we the media, need to, you need to educate them. All of us do. Yeah. Well, for, for sure, for sure. But, but I think that the, the, this is the job that the media has done so well is we all revolve around the pole of Trump. Right? I mean, Trump is the center of gravity now. Mm -hmm. And so that means that everything on the right and the left has been reflected through the prism of how does this affect President Trump and his administration as opposed to what do Democrats actually think and is this revealing of their thinking or is it more that they're just opposing Trump personally? Because they're, they're trying to use Trump's personal unpopularity as, mm -hmm. a, as a club to beat ideas that are actually good. Uh, and, and this is a perfect example. By the way, I think the reason that, that you're emotional about this is not because Obama didn't tell stories, he did. It's that the stories that were told tonight were stories that we feel have been ignored 
for yeah. literally more, at least a decade, and probably some of the Bush administration too. It, it, the, maybe longer than that, you know, specifically when the, the victims of illegal immigration are, are sitting yep, there yep. and crying. Mm. The, the story that was told about the, the family that adopted the kid, mm. like w w literally this week, the Democrats voted down a law that would have prevented abortion past 20 weeks. Yeah, right. And pain, pain, there, pain. It, I mean, I, I tweeted it out, but it's true. Cecile Richards would have said to that heroin mom, just abort the kid and then you don't have a problem. <laughs> yep. Shouldn't have been talking about saving That's the kid right. and adopting right. the kid. That's and so right. when we hear these stories, it feels like when, when Trump has talked about the forgotten man, on this stuff, we are the forgotten people, right? These are the stories that haven't been told for most of my life. Right. And so even I, who have not been a fan of the president for a lot of his rhetoric, that kind of rhetoric is, is really effective and really meaningful. And especially when the Democrats are so out of care, they're, they're so out of the box that they, they say things now like America is, is no better than North Korea. Like they literally say they, these they things. Do, and, and then we show a guy from North Korea holding up his crutches saying, I got out of there. And it's like, well, if you, if you can't see this dichotomy, you don't know what you're, what you're looking Who at. Who has been describing America as an s-hole for uh, the last 25 yeah. years? Yeah. yeah, I mean, Stephen Colbert see, did it openly, irony. right? Yeah. I'm sorry? The, the other day, Stephen Colbert did it openly on his show. Is that right? Oh, well, because, no, it, because yeah. after Trump made the asshole comment about other countries, yeah. and which, by the way, is in, it is inarguably true that there are other countries that are assholes. You no, know, you wrote that in your piece. I quoted I, it. Yeah. <laughs> no, remember, it, yeah. It, it was it's well a, said. I mean, there, there's, there's just no question about it. But Stephen Colbert got up and said, America's the real asshole because we elected Trump. And then mm, yep. Bono at the Grammys got up and said, thank God for asshole countries, because if it weren't for asshole countries, we wouldn't have all these people here. And it's like, well, Blessed no. Blessed the asshole countries. Uh, well, the, he, right, he actually said that during the Grammys. And that, wait, no, 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 no. Wait, forgive me. I don't understand this point. He said, if it weren't for asshole countries, we wouldn't have all these people here? We wouldn't have great people come to America. But that, that's not a reason to bless asshole countries. It's a reason to bless the people who came here. So he's, yeah. but at least, uh, isn't that like tantamount to agreeing with the president? I don't quite. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sort of. Yeah, yeah. Sort of yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. You know, I hate to take a more cynical view about all of this, but according to Pew Research, the people that the Democrats would give amnesty to today vote Democrat over Republican, identify Democrat over Republican between three times at the low end. 80 and 20. Eight, 80 20. It is up to 8.75 times more likely That's at right. the high end. Yes. That, is, that is the height of demagoguery. Totally. But, but you know, Dennis, with something you said about, about the idea of borders and the idea of countries specifically, you know, there's there's no question. None of us would disagree that this is becoming a global world. I mean, there's not there's no way to stop it becoming a global world. I can I can go on the computer and talk to somebody across the world in a minute. The question is, what does that look like? Does that look like one bland, uh, complete? you know, one people with one idea and no competition. What Trump is basically saying is, yeah, we're in the business of America. Okay, it's a global market. Our market is America. Our business is America. And that is a very powerful idea. I mean, that's an idea. This is one group that alive. I feel comfortable quoting the Bible to. <laughs> <laughs> that, that alone, I have to say, is, is so LA. rare. <laughs> <laughs> Just, yeah, I, that, I, that I'm levitating. Know, yeah. God blesses Abraham and says, "You, the, through you, and this is fascinating, will be blessed all the families of the earth and all the nations of the earth. God's, for those of us who believe that this stuff isn't a fairy tale, God's ideal is indeed that the world has families, and by that is meant a nuclear family, in, biblically speaking, and nations. Yeah. The abolition of nations is a catastrophe, is the Tower of Babel. Right. And that is what they want to do. Ab abolish the nation state. Of course it's a global world. You know, it's a, I just got an invitation, and it's really heartened me because of Prager, Prager University. With, uh, I've heard of them. Well, I've thank heard you. Of them. Named, named after your brother, as I recall. That, no, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my Uncle Murray. It's named after my Uncle Murray Prager. I love the guy. And thank you. I'm glad you mentioned that. And uh, I got an invitation just in the last, uh, last couple of months from young people in, in the country of Georgia and Romania to speak to them. They don't hear these ideas. I'm not, this is not an advertisement for Prague University. It's an advertisement for you, for us, for our values. I, when I go to Romania, and I'm t I took the speech, and when I go, I want Romania to stay Romania. It is a healthy thing to feel a bond that is specific to me, a Romanian. That, but to the, to the left, what I just said, is quasi-fascism. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in, in the New Testament, uh, Paul says that in Christ, there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. And one of my thoughts about the left is, uh, if it's a Christian virtue to think that 
as God, that God will one day redeem the world in such a way uh, that those boundaries won't exist between us anymore. What the left wants to do is put together things that God has separated without God. Always, and so always, when you take right, God out right. of that equation, there is no redemption in putting those things back together. You know, the, the removal of the nation as a secular, of the nation state as a secular exercise isn't holy. It's not, it's not part of uh, what I would see as the design of the earth. The, the earth as designed yes. was separated by God. Only he had the right to separate it. Only he has the right in his own time to put it back together. That's, uh, but, but the left, and we, we were talking before you walked in about the utopianism of libertarianism. I heard it, yep. Uh, mm -hmm. The left wants to, un the left is still busy doing what they were doing in the By garden, the way, is this which is trying to be good. Right. 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 Oh, yeah. you can make it we, we so actually, we only use is this the one from the Guggenheim? <laughs> Are you familiar with that the one? The tape, the tape, yeah. I think. We uh, exclusively. No, no, it's the Guggenheim. It's a Guggenheim, I'm sorry. Oh, they <laughs> offered the, oh, it's a terrible, forget, I'll f finish your story, then I want to tell you. We exclusively louder. ash in the Louder with Crowder t mug, <laughs> <laughs> which can be yours for $9.99 a month at CRTV. I love it. Yeah, yeah. I'm totally and happy to have it. one of the finest ashtrays yeah. uh, in conservatism. <laughs> I realize now what I have to donate to this set. You guys do not have a proper ashtray. I mean, that, that, <laughs> by the way, do you care about secondhand smoke? Because <laughs> this, Do I have a choice. Uh, I know, but I'm, <laughs> I mean, you're the only non-smoker in this room. I know. Uh, I'll pay. I'll, I'll pay a price for it later. I assume. Uh, <laughs> no, you won't. Let it everyone said this is pet peeve. Yes. So I, no, I'll be great. I'll, I'm healthier today. So <laughs> are, are you ready? Listen to this. The Guggenheim uh, had uh, this about a year ago. They they their newest exhibit is an all gold solid gold toilet. It's, it's very expensive. <laughs> yeah. Made by an Italian quote-unquote artist. And it operates. It actually flushes. You pay a fee at the Guggenheim and you can urinate or defecate no. into the toilet. Oh, good. Just but like here's the punchline. Yeah. <laughs> so, right, by the way, that, that in and of itself is important because the, uh, again, the godless world of, mm -hmm. the, of, the le of left arts is filled with scat sc the scatological. Yeah, of course, right. they of course. love fecal matter, urine, menstrual blood, uh, uh, mucus. They they love it. I can't wait to take that quote out of context. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the punchline. You know what the name of the toilet, the the, the exhibit's name is, America. Oh, no of kidding. You can literally defecate and urinate on America at the Guggenheim Museum. Wow. I, well, I can become a Democrat. Look at what they did to the Virgin Mary. Look at what they did in mm -hmm. Piss Christ. Yep. They're obsessed yep. with it. At all of these, the Women's March and all of the Democrat marches, it's just profanities. It's just obscenities and vulgarisms. Mm -hmm. So they, they yell at Donald Trump for using naughty language every once in a while. Their entire political that's activism right. yeah. is, right. is... But it makes, perfect, right. it makes perfect sense. You remove the spirit, you remove God, what are you left with? That, this is what you're left with. Right. Left well, with the there's nothing to the elevate us to. Of course. Yeah. We're animals. Yeah, and and it and it and it does. You know, I always do feel people uh, attack the left as being somehow evil, but they are they are following the logic of the spiritual less right. world, and it, if, it, it right. makes perfect sense. Well, I mean, you're going to have to blame the the problems that mankind sees on something, yeah. and it, and yeah. so right. for yeah. so for us, we we blame it on human nature. We say that human beings That's are right. inherently flawed, and this is just yeah. the way that it is, yeah. and this yeah. is why we set all these checks and balances, and we inculcate virtue in our children, mm -hmm. and this is why you need religion, this is why you need God. And they can't do that because that automatically leads to God. The minute you say human nature is flawed, so the only way that you can cure that is by reaching beyond ourselves to, to our creator. Uh -huh. They can't deal with that. So instead what they say is, no, what's really made human beings flawed is the rules. So if we just violate every taboo, right. then suddenly human beings will be, will be cured and elevated. Uh, right. And so they, they think they're actually doing a service by freeing man of our, of our weird hang-ups about uh, our fetishisms about not glorifying pee and poo. And, and, and somehow and, we're going to we're somehow going to make man greater. And the corollary of that is yeah. that your dignity and your self-respect come from me. That in other words, I have to approve of you in order for you have to have self-respect. So if you're gay, if you're transsexual, if you're whatever, it, it, the pro the problem you have is not that you're uh, at, at odds with some kind of uh, archetype in yourself or some kind of God-given archetype. The problem you have is that I don't accept you as you are. Well, so you have to exactly destroy right. me. Yeah. And, and this is it, it was something that I was pointing out about the, the Grammys on my show. And that was the the unbelievable focus. So Me Too was supposedly about more than just don't molest and harass women. It was supposedly about female dignity. Right. So to show they're promoting female dignity, they've got women dancing on stage like strippers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, and, and so the, these two things do not coincide. Now, 
it's a free country, you can do what you want. Right. But the idea that this is somehow elevating the dignity of women, and that if I don't grant you dignity it, when you are doing something that is inherently undignified, right. that somehow I am assaulting your sense of and, dignity. And that it's your problem. Yeah. Right, it's, it's my problem for yeah. not changing what the word dignity means to fit <laughs> right. what you're doing right, right. now. Yeah. Is the, 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 the lapse into complete subjectivism is, is frightening. This is why in the 1950s, Dwight Eisenhower put in the Gettysburg Address that we are one nation under God. That was a little bit too uh, subtle. <laughs> uh, we're going to kick it back to Alicia and take a few more questions. One last time, uh, questions that are being submitted uh, on Facebook. Alicia, are you with us? I am still here. I'm still in the bunker. And thankfully, <laughs> the vegetable tray did make it to me, even oh, yeah, though yeah. I'm like 30 miles away. So really I didn't good even job, guys. I didn't even notice it was missing, Alicia. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Johnny K says, gentlemen, I believe your blocked and deleted YouTube live stream still has more viewers than did Joe Kennedy's response to Donald Trump. <laughs> Let's and then if you weren't with us, YouTube uh, blocked our live stream for playing the State of the Union. Uh, we were using the C-SPAN, which is owned by the government, using the C-SPAN feed, which is public domain. YouTube sort of affiliate, uh, the Young Turks, was using the same stream, and they were not blocked. But of course, there's no bias. I don't want you to get the wrong idea. <laughs> so for those who don't know, Prager University is currently suing YouTube for discrimination. Yeah, that's so. right. By the way, I'll tell you a story. Let Alicia give me more. I have a powerful little anecdote Please, about share, YouTube. Please, share it now. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah. So they blocked, they've uh, not blocked, but they have put on the restricted list 40 of the Prager University videos. Well, they must have been what, very, very crazy. Radical, hate no, radical yeah. graphic yeah. stuff, yeah. like yeah. the history of the Korean War by Victor <laughs> Davis Hanson. We all know Victor Davis Hanson is hey, really a monster. Hot stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Hot stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Hot stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Hot stuff. That's the first thing. That's right. <laughs> so this, this is a proof of proofs. I debated, uh, I debated a left-wing Jew. I'm, I'm a conservative Jew. I debated a left-wing Jew at the biggest temple in San Francisco uh, last month. I'm a guy from J Street. Mm -hmm. Okay. That debate is now on the restricted list. Oh, my wow. goodness. So half of it is a leftist speaking. But I feel that I prevailed in that debate. This is, I'm not bragging because that's the only possible reason they yeah. would restrict right. it. Right, of course. The conservative may have looked good yeah. with a leftist. That cannot be seen. 50% yeah. conservative is too much conservative. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yes. right. Alicia. Yeah. Ian Hatch has a question for everyone there, including Dennis, that he wants to know, who is your favorite all-time historical military figure? Mm. Ooh. Oof. <laughs> Gosh, guys. I, I mean, come on. <laughs> Phil Cohen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely <just> agree. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, you're my man. He's not well known. No. <laughs> I have to admit, he was actually a barber. Yeah. Uh, but, but the troops. <laughs> I, 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 this is. I forgive me, Alicia. Who's our? Full, there were so many great. There's no yeah. favorite. I don't have a favorite. I, I have there a were favorite. too many great. Ones. Who's your favorite? My favorite is George Washington. Because George Washington yeah. figured out that you could lose forever and still win the war if you knew what you were doing, and that is one of the great secrets. He was, of it was awesome. That is one of the great secrets all, of great empires. Yeah. Mm. Great empires lose wars, lose battles continually, but win the war, mm. and that was George Washington's strategy. So for me, I would have to, I'd have to go with either Sherman, uh, or with uh, or with MacArthur, mm -hmm. uh, who was correct about the Korean War. I know people don't want to That's hear right. that because he was <laughs> right about right. the Korean yeah, of War. Course he was. The, reason that, the yep. reason that China still exists as a communist slave state is because we did not listen to, right. to Douglas MacArthur about the necessity for taking out China in the Korean right. War. Just, just, uh, I agree with you. I just want to say on behalf of Truman, he, the, the fear of a war with China was real. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I must say there are some, there are some good popes. There was the Battle of Lepanto, the Battle of Tours. Of there course. was the there were the, the first crusade. But I will I, I'd actually like to give it to Winston Churchill. Yeah. He's very popular now. Because when well, because Winston Churchill was so the man. So you see him as a military leader. Yes. Very uh, a middle military mm -hmm. leader. World War One he wasn't such a great it wasn't so hot, no, yeah, except there's a wonderful painting from nineteen nineteen that depicts all of the leaders of World War One. They're talking about how happy they are about the peace. And there's only a light shining on Churchill. And he's looking out with his head in his hands. He's so upset. And Winston Churchill had exactly the Painted right attitude. Painted in 1919. Painted, yeah, begun in 1919. It yeah. went on forever. The guy died before it was finished. But the Winston Churchill, had a, he, he flew airplanes, even though he was a terrible pilot. And so he crashed them multiple times. The third time Winston Churchill crashed an airplane, it was nearly fatal. It was a really terrible crash. And he was a war hero from the Boer War and, and uh, a little less so from World War I as First Order of the Admiralty. But he came out and they said, aren't you afraid of dying? Why do you keep flying these planes? You're obviously a terrible pilot. And he said, I love life, 
but I do not fear death. <laughs> and that is exactly the right attitude. Those you are words to live by. Those are words to live by. Don't just say, well, yep. I'm not afraid of death. I love life, yeah. but I do not fear death. By the way, it, w it was largely uh, my love of the absurd that I said Phil Cohen, <laughs> but there was an element of, of truth to that. It's, they're not leaders, mm -hmm. but the, the, the average soldier mm. going on to the Normandy beach yeah. oh. is the person I first think of when I think of heroes That's right. in, in the military yeah, good, realm. Good, good point there. Yeah. All right, Charles has a question for Dennis. Mr. Prager, which room in your estimation is nicer? The God King Jeremy Boring's <laughs> headquarters or your home library where you film mm. your Prager U fireside mm. chats? Wow, um, <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> Since I can smoke a cigar in both, I have no preference. <laughs> could be in, is missing, right? Dennis, You're Dennis missing the dog. Dennis could be in prison, and so long as he's smoking a cigar. <laughs> yeah. like, this is the greatest room I've ever been in. My last wish. For, I don't really want the last dinner. Just bring me a Here's good a cigar. cigar, yeah. cigar. <laughs> this question is from Colby, and it's for everyone in the room. What books would you put on a mandatory reading list for college students? Mm. I have a list, by the way, uh, at, at, uh, at DennisPrager.com. Alicia, I have I have a list, uh, and uh, I'll just give a couple, okay? Because mm -hmm, please, yeah. Oh, thanks. So uh, uh, <laughs> the fact that I'm hesitating is the is a bad sign. <laughs> the Bible is so magnificent, but it needs to be understood. It's like you can't yeah. read Shakespeare today yeah. without a commentary. And uh, let me make a plug. I've never plugged a book in my life. This is a cause, not a book. Nobody writes a commentary on the Bible to make a lot of money. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. On April 2nd, my 130,000 word commentary on the book of Exodus is coming out. Wow. wow. And to explain its greatness. Beyond that, Man's Search for Mini Meaning by Viktor Frankl changed mm. my life. In high school, I realized we only have one ultimate freedom. When everything else is taken away, there is still one that cannot be taken away. How we react to what happens to us. You can't choose cancer, you can't choose to be hit by a drunk driver, you can't choose to have troubled parents or troubled children or whatever, but you can choose how you react. So I'll put those in. That's terrific. Okay. Ben and I were having this conversation uh, recently because of a little secret project we're working on mm -hmm. here, and uh, we had a similar concern about the Bible. I mean, certainly the book of Genesis and the book of John are two seminal works of, to understand Western civilization. You need to understand Genesis and John. Uh, and I, I'll say that long before we knew one another, I listened to your teachings on Genesis that you did at, at um, University of Judaism. University of yeah. Judaism, and it was uh, really helped shape a lot of my thinking well, about well, that means our a lot relationship. To me. Thank you. But it is difficult to to point people to the Bible without any kind of anchoring. That's why I commentary. hope that this will inaugurate. I'm doing the yeah. first five books and Exodus. I started with and Exodus. I'm angry. Not I've been Genesis. asking you for a review copy, and you're not going to give it to me until it's already out. I'm going to give it to you the second I have one. Okay. Do you want one? Get no, out. no. Would you want one in Word format? It's pretty, it's I'll read pretty, it. I mean. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll, you'll have it tonight. I, I, it would be my honor. Oh, no. I, I, I love that stuff. So, yeah. The, I know you do. I know. We, we both do. Because we come from a similar world where you, you will totally relate and you will find this interesting. I don't read fast. I'll bet you do. Relatively quickly. Right. Yeah. And, but I know one of the reasons I don't. We both went to yeshivas, which mm -hmm. is half-day Jewish studies in Hebrew, half-day uh, secular studies in English. It's very intense, and we both went through high school. Different ones, obviously, and even at different times, if you can tell. <laughs> but, the, uh, but there was a brilliant way of learning. Why does it say this and not this? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. I, I read newspaper articles like that. Mm -hmm. Why did the New York Times use this word, but not this word? Mm. And, and it, 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 it slows me down, but I really understand what's going on by doing that. I'll give you one example. This was Bruce Hershenson gave this example. Fidel Castro was always uh, the Cuban leader, but uh, a right-wing dictator in Nicaragua or, or yeah, the yeah, Dominican they, Republic yeah. was a dictator. Mm. Right. Yeah. There were no communist dictators in the New York Times. Mm. Right. right. There were only right-wing dictators. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we should leave out. I mean, I, I would definitely put the Bible and Shakespeare, and I, I, I would trust mm. people to find their way back th you know, to the commentaries. And, uh, in other I, words, think, I think that if you, if you read the Bible with an open mind and you don't yes. go in with the 
perversely anti-biblical mentality of the new yeah, atheist right. school I'm sure. who are just going in to just be angry but, but at the Bible. Way, I, but in a way, I think that you just said something important because I was going to suggest uh, that you guys read a lot of nonfiction. I read fiction, and mm. I find truth in fiction. I'm a storyteller. I'm yeah. a Hollywood guy. Uh, when you say the Bible and Shakespeare, I think you are providing a commentary on the Bible. That, well, that's, that's right. Shakespeare words, is that, a commentary. Yeah, of course. True yeah. fiction, but, Lincoln, but right? I also, yeah, true <laughs> fiction well, leads you yeah. to the truth. But I also, think, I also think we could not leave out uh, some Plato and Aristotle, and specifically mm. Uh, the Sympo Plato Symposium but and, that does and Aristotle's Nicomachean uh, Ethics. Yeah. I, These have I, to be taught, I think. Yeah, they do have to be. Well, I mean, but, it's but, the truth. What I'm, I guess what I'm picturing when, when we were asked this question, like I'm picturing a, class, a, desert, a desert island sort of where we, we have nothing else but this. What would I start with? And it would be this. Because right, I mean, when it comes to books that I would just start with that don't require commentary, I'd start with like Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, maybe A History of the American People by Paul Johnson. Ah, so you're going right, down. That, but see, those, the, because, because this is stuff that you can read on. But this is stuff that you can read on your own and understand but in terms of kind of foundations of western civilization of course if you're going to start with the basics but you require a teacher i mean all this yes. stuff requires a rav i mean in the, in the <laughs> jewish in the in sort of the jewish parlance to, to to learn plato aristotle it's very difficult to learn on your own. i know because i'm doing some remedial reading of it now yeah and and it really is something that has to be commented upon and taught and even if you read natural right in history by strauss which is a commentary on this stuff you need a yeah. commentary yeah, on yeah. strauss in order to understand strauss. Are, we leaving, strauss, yeah. Yeah. are we leaving out the obvious reasons to vote for democrats well, this <laughs> would be my <laughs> contribution that this, does, but that really needs a teacher <laughs> it does need a teacher i i offer this service like human like human wisdom <laughs> oh, yeah. someone you know, really does have to guide I'm, you i am here for you and i would also i would a lot of books aren't taught anymore they used to be you they would be taught so dante i think is not taught as much I I think the comedy offers as much as they're anything. They're all white. They're, they're, that's they're too why, white. No, no, that's why they're <laughs> not Dante's a little swarthy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 fair enough. But Mucky, I, I would Mucky say about Valley. some of these philosophers, it, it is worthwhile. These philosophers are tough. I mean, reading reading Kant is almost Kant's impossible. Yeah. Right? So, so, what, so but, it's, it's, but, it's, but it's Plato, sometimes... Plato's I'm not sure it's No, Plato's... Plato's, Plato's real, I have I'm, to say. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure it is. I'm sure the struggle is real. I'm not sure it is either. I think you're almost better off reading Will Durant's summary of various philosophers and their main points than actually he, he struggling through the word-by-word word word of some of this stuff. Argue, I would argue I'm not sure it's true for Aristotle, by the way, who's actually pretty terse, right? I, I mean, Nicobacan ethics is pretty... I would argue the symposium and the ethics are very basic, very uh, dramatic, and, and quite clear, and, and that you can... Those are the foundations. You can't have the guy. You can't have the Jenga tower starting at the top. I mean, right, I totally agree. I mean, the bottom. not only do I agree with this, I'm writing a book on it right now. Oh, so I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is my, my actual book. Starts with. Uh, so the, the book. The book is about uh, the, the the why it is that we have fallen into political tribalism so strongly, and it seems to me that it's because we have a God-shaped and reason-shaped hole in our hearts that's now being filled with passion and tribalism. That's right. And that's, so, that's true. And yeah. so yeah. What I, the first third of the book is right. just tracing the foundations of Western civilization that nobody learned. So there's a full chapter on the Hebrew Bible, and then there's a full chapter on Plato and Aristotle, and then there's a chapter on the New Testament, and it, it literally moves forward in history mm -hmm. like that through Aquinas. I'm, I, right now, I am up to, I'm up to Aquinas, and, th and then I actually get to Machiavelli, the moderns. Yeah. Um, but, it, but it's... This stuff is is not taught at all. So I'm trying to I'm trying to simplify it enough that people can actually understand. Mm -hmm. it. Alicia, yeah. did you expect such a long answer? <laughs> no, I should have. I should have. It's, it's, that's not for me. That's for the audience. The audience <laughs> is like, wait, what was the question? The <laughs> poor girl right. just wanted to know. What yeah, that's right. I know. I'm not for Democrats. That's the answer. I'm my own book. Illustrated. All right. I'll plug my own book. That's it's not out till the middle of next year. The tentative title is the destruction of the American soul. Brayden Large says any list without Fifty Shades of Grey trilogy on it. Uh, oh, yeah, no, no, <laughs> absolutely. So I forgot true, about that. So yeah, that true. Slipped my mind. Yeah. Okay, final question is from Melissa. And she has a, a question for Dennis and Andrew, the most wise gentleman in the room, she says. She actually <laughs> calls you <laughs> She calls you wise elders. I mean, hey, that's in the Bible. We're, we're supposed to respect you, right? We meet at the show <laughs> yes. every Friday night. That's correct. <laughs> Melissa <laughs> says, why, oh, why? Have you lived in California for so long? When does it become too wacky a state to live in? Oh, that's a great question. Mm. That is an excellent question. I think uh, by the was it who one of you I think made the point, and maybe it was, I know it wasn't me. That's all I could say, and I never want to take credit for an idea that isn't mine. We that's another thing we learn in yeshiva, right? Uh, but uh, somebody pointed out that Southern California is really the hotbed of young and resurgent conservatism. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I mean all of our groups and our our own selves are, are just examples of it. So it's an interesting phenomenon. I, 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 don't, I can't fully explain it. Of course, because I fire actually, refines. I'm sorry? Fire refines. We're all Right, but New York is fire. Well, you know, they have City Journal. They have some good stuff. Yeah. But, but 
I, I, I will, but, and, and San Francisco doesn't have any of this, so it's Southern California. But I will say this, the truth is, I love it here. I, 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 I hate to admit it, <laughs> uh, but, I, but I do, uh, and, and I bet you do too, to a large extent. And, yes. and you know what, there are a lot of wonderful people here. That's the thing, there are really are a lot of wonderful people, and uh, also, I, I'm a big believer that without friends, it's very hard to navigate life. That's well. That's true. And my friends are here. Oh, here we disagree. So why would I leave? <laughs> <laughs> what, your friends are you know, not here. No, I don't have friends. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but his true we're, colors we're, coming we're, out. We're, we're, his we're his friends, but he doesn't acknowledge it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I, have a slight, I have a slightly different answer. I, I am a person who loves the countryside. I love being by myself. I love being out in the wilderness. And yet, used to winter in New Hampshire. Uh, uh, yeah, and yet <laughs> I have spent. I have spent most of Connecticut. Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> and yet I've. Spent most of my life in coastal cities and the reason for that is I am a culture guy I'm a culture creator and I'm someone who believes in fighting for the culture and one of the things that drives me crazy about conservatives is they want to affect the culture but they don't want to get the mud mm -hmm. of the culture on their hands yeah. and I believe in being part of this of this enterprise part of this enterprise and part of and the culture is created no matter what anybody thinks it's created in LA and it's created in New York and even though I am not always comfortable in these cities, I'm really comfortable in these businesses that thrive here, doing what you do, even if it means fighting my corner, which I don't mind. Well, you know? One of the, I give a little speech sometimes to young conservatives who want to move into politics or, or entertainment. And they're usually, in the groups that I tend to speak to, young, Christian, idealistic, often homeschooled. Uh, and I often tell them that the three most corrupting influences ever devised by man are wealth, power, and fame. But we all hope to wield those very powers in some way in service of our values. And one of the things that I caution them about is you will be scarred. You know, Moses didn't get to enter the land of promise. And we, uh, I think we've all burned our fingers a little bit with our pursuits. But at the same time, uh, God's put us in a position where we've been able to wield them on behalf of what's good. To your point, though, uh, you said so eloquently about friendship. And I agree with that. C.S. Lewis says you have to live where your friends are. Yep. Uh, but Don Henley mm. uh, said it this way about L.A. Let's go down to the Sunset Grill. Watch the working <laughs> girls go by. Watch the basket people walk around and mumble. <laughs> gaze out at the Auburn sky. Maybe we'll leave come springtime. Meanwhile, we'll have another beer. What would we do without these jerks anyway? And besides that... All our friends are here. <laughs> was that done? That, was that's that, how that was, it ends. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. That is awesome. Wow. That's great. Alicia, thank you so much. And to everyone watching on Facebook and previously on YouTube, uh, we're grateful for your time tonight. Grateful that you uh, uh, hung out with us for a little bit and are thankful for your questions. We're going to uh, let Alicia go home and have a life. And we're going to wrap up with 10 more minutes of uh, visiting together and hope to see you all back uh, tomorrow morning for the guys and all their, uh, and all their content. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. You tell me we have to do a show tomorrow. <laughs> Are you ready for a great fame story? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, look if it doesn't have groupies now, it's close. It's close. You, you will, no, I can you, only live vicariously through through others. This was a truly, it was this was a truly great humbling moment for me. So, uh, I feel funny saying it, but it, it's still stupid not to say. Look, I, I, I am all not always, but I, every day somebody recognizes me, okay? It's, it's inevitable. I, I've been in public life. You're also life. the biggest Jew on planet Earth. That's right. <laughs> well, by the way, that's, that right. All right. Right. So, yeah, that's actually related. <laughs> I'm standing at LAX waiting for my wife to pick me up about a year and a half ago, and this young Hispanic woman keeps looking at me, which is already flattering, and, uh, and uh, that's great, and so on. And that happens a lot. People are, are, are debating whether they should come over. Okay. Yeah. Finally, she gathers the courage to walk over and she goes, are you? And whenever people go, are you? Uh, as a sort of a joke, I go, yes, pleasure to meet you. And, and then, so I, she goes, are you? And I go, yes, Phil Jackson? <laughs> <laughs> so I had to spend five minutes explaining I don't walk around saying I'm Phil Jackson. <laughs> it, it was truly a great humbling moment. I thought he was Phil Jackson too. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yes. We got a hey, 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 the producers hey, hey, about this. This is the nice uh, thing about wearing the yarmulke. No one's ever going to think I work in the basketball. That, that's right. That's a good point. Good point. Right. <laughs> One of the great comments on Facebook that I saw a second ago was, uh, Prager and Shapiro in the same room is like having the white and green Power Ranger on the same episode. <laughs> <laughs>
It is true. The so, who and the who? <laughs> <laughs> so now, now I want to ask just randomly, uh, Dennis, you, you don't read fiction much, do you? Correct. I okay, so right. do, but you have read some, I assume. You've read a fiction book? <laughs> oh, of course. I mean, I, you can't graduate high school without having, or in college. And by the way, I love great fiction. I just had to make a decision at a given right. point. Where do you want to spend your time? That's right. Yeah. Yes, that was it. Okay, but I'll ask you because it's an off the beaten track question. So what? Let's go around and do uh, like two favorite fiction books because mm. mm. that's kind of fun. Do you know? Oddly enough, this really stayed with me. A, a book by Emile Zola, La Samoire, which is the the butchery. I lived it. I lived in France in was it the nineteenth century, and I I I it made a deep impact. And here's another one that people probably never heard of. It's probably, because uh, I, I specialized in communist affairs. I was at the Russian Institute at Columbia, and I studied Russian. I've been to all, almost all the communist countries. And uh, here's a novel which absolutely competes uh, with uh, 1984 uh, to explain what life in, is, uh, an, an animal farm, what life under communism is like. It's one of the least well-known books of Ayn Rand, We the Living. Yeah, I've read mm. oh, yeah. that. That really gives you an yeah. idea of what life under communism is yeah, like. No question. No question. Okay, Drew, since you're the most well-read person in the room when it comes to fiction, I think <laughs> yeah. by a long shot. Yeah. What's well, I, I mean, I always say that the, the novel that affected me most beyond, by a long shot is Crime and Punishment. I was Fine 19 too. the first Same time. Thing. I was 19 the first time I read it. I was surrounded by the new relativists who were just rising up, the new multiculturalists, and, and uh, Dostoevsky basically makes the case through a, an incredible great mystery suspense novel he makes the case that there is a moral fabric to the world mm -hmm. that Kant was right there was a moral law within and a starry sky above and those are the two realities and I read that book and I remember putting it down and, and literally putting my face in my hands and thinking that's right that's undeniable you cannot deny that and it changed the course of my life it turned the ship of my life toward now uh, the I'm star gonna, of God. And I'm gonna give you a gift <laughs> that will bowl over any uh -huh. Russian. Okay. You ready? Yeah. This is crime and punishment in Russian. <laughs> Prestuplenie i nakazanie. As I always say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and did did Dennis Prayer collude with the Russians? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't want to start the FBI investigation. I blew it. I blew it. <laughs> and since we're doing two books, only recently, I read this like two years ago, the most entertaining novel I have ever read. It's four, I'm, I'm a slow reader. I, mm -hmm. I, am, I think I may be a little dyslexic, I'm so slow. This book is 1,400 pages long. I read the last 400 pages in a single day, mm -hmm. and that is The Count of Monte Cristo. That's a great book. Yeah. It's, it's a great book. Dumas it's, is fantastic. It's, Dumas is fantastic. Alexander Dumas, that's amazing. Yes, he's so great, but, <laughs> this, but this book is so entertaining because it starts out as a typical, uh, you know, uh, uh, what we call swashbuckler, a typical right. swashbuckling adventure, and then it becomes this deep meditation on the romance of revenge. And it's really a book about how revenge belongs to God. And yet mm. it's so yeah, Have you seen the, the movie version with Jim Cavazil is pretty good. I hear it's pretty good. It yes. is pretty good. I, but, I like that movie a lot, actually. But I, Guy I, Pierce I've is the, waited is the and waited because this book just blew my mind. Huh. I, mean, I, I love you know, his stuff. He's, yes, he's really he's, terrific. He's one he's he's really terrific. Book, I think did you know, did you know <laughs> his story about uh, Alexander Dumas? He was not paid by the word, he was paid by the line. So he actually, so really, so what was Dickens paid by? Dickens was supposedly paid by the word, but he was actually paid by the installment, I think. But the but the the story about Dumas is that he would write characters who would only say these very short lines of dialogue, like one word dialogue, <laughs> specifically in order to pad his his count. And so when the newspaper came back to him, because all these things were serialized, when yeah. the newspaper came back to him and said, "We're no longer going to pay you by the line," he killed off one of his characters. <laughs> he said, "There's no purpose for this character anymore," so he just got rid of the him. writer's life. Right. 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 I have to say, on the crime yeah, and punishment line, thing, line, line, yeah. I got off one of the best one of the best tweets I've ever gotten off that <laughs> no one got, of course, was there was a story about in Russia. A dog shot its owner, like got a hold of the, <laughs> got a hold of the gun and shot its owner. And so I tweeted out something like, uh, and I want to get the wording correct. It was something like. Uh, why would a good dog let bad things happen? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the wonderful thing about Crime and Punishment is it is a, an answer to Nietzsche, but Nietzsche hadn't published anything yeah. yet. And he just, Dostoevsky did this continually. He saw communism coming. He was a seer. He, he was a mm -hmm. genuine seer. Mm -hmm. And he saw this argument coming down the pike, and he answered it before anybody made it. Okay, Do you have a favorite translator, by the way? Yes, the, the latest one. I can't forget their name. It, no, Constance Garnett is, is really dated, and she also would cut anything dirt. She was like, like a nice Victorian maiden, and she would cut anything sexual out. Uh -huh. the, the newest one, by, it's by a married couple whose name I don't remember, but it's by two, a man and a woman, is excellent. Are they the ones who just translated War and Peace also? 
I yes, think so. Yeah, yes, it's a great they translation. Did. It's really, a great really good. Yes, and their and their crime and punishment, which I read only a couple of years ago, uh, is great. So, Knowles, you, you actually read books. You don't just not write. <laughs> them. Occasionally, I read them. Yeah, yeah, I read once, more yeah. than I write. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, I ha well, I hate to be the poor man's Andrew Clavin. I would. My favorite novel is uh, Crime and Punishment. That's, I well, thought I was the poor man's Andrew. Clavin. <laughs> <laughs> just a poor man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the one I would recommend that isn't read a lot, but I think is really good, is I Promessi Sposi by Manzoni. It's a novel. Oh, you're an ass. I know. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a very conservative book. It's a book that will never be taught because of that. It's a it's the betrothed. It's about the betrothed. It's oh, a, it's a yeah. wonderful. You know, yeah, it's, it's a famous novel. Yeah. It's a it's a wonderful novel, and not a soul reads it other than people who read Italian. And it, but it's really good. You should definitely it's, read it. It's much beloved. Yeah, I, I've only read about five or six novels in my life, and that you know that's a good one. <laughs> that's, yeah. uh, one of my favorite novels is also one of your favorite novels, and I don't want to steal it because it's it's a better your favorite novel than mine. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, a popular piece of pulp fiction, modern fiction, um, because it affected me at a young age in the same way that uh, Crime and Punishment uh, affected you, and in, in, in that it helped shape my view of the world when I was when I was in a theologically and politically formative time. Uh, and it's by uh, a living author named Stephen Lawhead, and it's called it, it's just. Oh, no, this is, you get to claim this one. You, you, yeah. you recommended it to me, so I obviously did. this is yours. Uh, it's actually a, a trilogy of books about Arthurian uh, yeah. Britain called yeah. The Pendragon Cycle. Yeah. And I read this when I was uh, 18 years old. I'd, I had an overnight radio station uh, on today's hit country, K Triple L. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and as I was playing. Where was that? In Lubbock, Texas. <laughs> Metropolis. Oh, that's yeah. right. You're from Lubbock. That's, that's right. right. Yeah. And I, I read these books, which were uh, really about the collapse of Romanism in Britain and the beginning of Christianity. Uh, and, and I recommend them, Ben, you've read them. They're very good. And they, they really help teach me about what motivates people. Uh, and I think that's what great fiction can do. It mm. That's what great story, great film uh, helps us understand what, you know, our motivations. Uh, I'll brag on Clavin for a moment and say that I think, Andrew, where your fiction is at its best uh, is when you write the internal uh, monologue of a man, yeah. what he actually is thinking yeah, about. Yeah, Jeremy, when I want to push you to actually give up the thriller writing and just write a book that is an internal monologue. Because it would be <laughs> incredible. Oh, man. I'm yeah. not, not joking yeah. at all. Uh, not yeah, joking yeah, okay. in the slightest. It's so insightful. That's why your book, The Great Good Thing, is so good, because it basically yeah. is that. It's just uh -huh. your internal monologue. So, I mean, if you did that. Interesting. And then I'll, uh, I'll go a different direction and talk about my least favorite book, and it's a, it's a book of just the last couple of years, and it's called uh, 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 Based on a True Story by Norm MacDonald. And no. this, <laughs> this book, which the four of us read, yeah. and, mm -hmm. uh, pissed me off. It's, it's supposed to be a celebrity tell-all. Oh, uh, you wanted those salacious details. <laughs> yeah, and the only actual uh, telling all that he does is a story about him going to prison, which I don't even think is true. <laughs> you think, yeah, <laughs> and, I yeah, I don't know. And uh, the big reveal that uh, Rodney Dangerfield got no respect. <laughs> and so I feel like this is... So. The worst book. Yeah. Yeah. It, was more on, it was more on Carrot Top, you know. No, the worst I book mean, is that? Reasons to Vote Democrat by Michael. But it's thorough. It's thorough. It is short. It's, it's, short. it's a quick read. I mean, no. I'll say that for it. But so. while a terrible memoir, as novels go, based it, it, on a true story, is the funniest thing I've ever read. It is one of the funniest things I've ever read. I'll put a plug in for in terms of funniest things I've ever read that aren't fiction. Adam Carolla's first book. Uh, in 50 Years Will All Be Chicks is good. hysterically funny. Yeah. Um, but uh, as far as favorite novels for me, uh, so uh, my, my anti-communist novel, since we all have an obligatory one, is Darkness at Noon by Arthur Kessler, uh, great which, book. Uh, which yeah. nobody's great read book. now. It's amazing. No, it's like it a really a short, novel. quick yeah. read, yep. uh, yeah. and it's just fantastic. Um, Moby Dick was, was my oh. favorite book for many, many years wow. because uh, I, I think that every, if, if you're a religious person, you haven't gone through the struggle of why does God do what he does, which of course is the same theme as crime and punishment, yeah. uh, or really more of, of uh, Brothers Karamazov, then you haven't been a religious person. Like the great myth about religious people is that we don't think about these things all the time, <laughs> the whole day. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, when, when you talk to people, like when, when, I, when I'll debate, um, when I'll debate uh, Sam, uh, Sam, Sam Harris, Harris. Uh, and when we'll talk about atheism, and he'll, he'll act like the, the problem of theodicy has never occurred to religious people. <laughs> um, and oh, it's, it's just- Forgive me, I have to tell you this, this quick anecdote. I was invited, to their credit, by the American Atheist, the biggest atheist organization, to debate their, their head in Minneapolis a number of years ago. After, uh, or during the debate, I looked at the audience, all of whom were atheists, and I said, would you raise your hand if anything ever happens, like the birth of your own child, that ever, ever even prompts you to question your atheism? Mm. 
Not one hand wow, went up. Wow, wow. Yeah. Now, that's a great story. And then I said, you know, I don't, I've never been with a religious person who didn't question their faith. That's a great yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it, we wow. this is question. Right. This is right. Atheists, you don't. Atheists yeah. are significantly wow. more religious than religious people. Yeah. Like this, I actually you said this to, to yeah. Sam Harris Absolutely. in the debate. I actually said to him, you're a more religious person than I am, and I'm mm -hmm. the one on stage wearing a yarmulke. Um, <laughs> but it's, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, so Moby Dick is up there. The, the, the pasteboard mask speech, uh, if you haven't read the book, the, the speech yeah. where, where Ahab talks specifically about how he sees Moby Dick as, as a pasteboard mask, and if he can pierce through the pasteboard mask and get at God. I mean, the whole story is really about him trying to take revenge on God for having sent this whale to cripple him. Uh, and it's, it's, just, it's just fantastic. So I love that book. Uh, there's, a, there's a book that, my, my Arthurian book is actually T.H. White's Once in Future King. Now, the second half of that book is fantastic. The first half's a little long, but the second half is really great. But uh, a book that nobody knows, but I recommended to Drew, and you liked it, uh, was Every Man, Di uh, yes, it was, yes, uh, did like Every it, Man yeah. Dies Alone yeah. uh, by Hans Falada, which is a little known German author who lived under the Nazis, was imprisoned under the Nazis, and the entire book is about this couple. It's, it's just fantastic. It's, it's about this couple, um, this older couple whose son was in the German army and has died in the German army, and now that, and now that couple is trying to figure out a way to kind of live with each other, and they're so angry that their son has been killed in Hitler's war that they decide that the only way they can stand up against this is to put out these pamphlets, these propaganda pamphlets, anonymously, just in the middle of the public thoroughfare, and it's and the whole thing is about how they're drawn closer together as as human beings by fighting for this cause, even though they know that the cause isn't going to do any good, uh, and they know that this is in essence futile. But yeah. they fall in love with the romanticism of of the cause, uh, and it's it's just it really is it, it's great writing actually. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a weird book because it's such a bleak story, but but it's really uplifting. You finish it, and you're like, wow, yeah, this, this I know, works. I know. I love weird. that feeling. I mean, it's it's yeah. rare that it, it's like a Shakespearean tragedy. Like yeah. you finish a Shakespearean tragedy, and there's something about it where, where you're you don't feel like th this is. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of of the uh, Walter Kerr. Uh, the former critic for the New York yeah. Times. Uh, so he wrote, wrote a book called Comedy and Tragedy, and what he said is that comedy in the end is slightly depressing, and tragedy in the end is slightly uplifting. Mm. It's kind, because, of like, because kind of like Brawl in Cell Block 99, right? It's uplifting. No, it's <laughs> oh my God, I can't believe you made me watch that. So, uh, but so it, we've, been, we've yeah. been live on the air for four hours now, and there are still 2,000 people uh, <laughs> braving it with us, and I feel like it would be a disservice to keep them up too much longer. Yeah. Uh, and let me just say, this has been exactly what I had hoped for, which is, uh, not just us talking about politics all night, but us actually just enjoying each other's company and having the kind of conversations that we get to have with one another uh, on a regular basis, but that uh, other people don't really get to ever hear us having because they usually just get the product, right? The, mm -hmm. the result of these conversations is what makes the Dennis Prager shows, what makes the Ben Shapiro show, makes the Andrew Clavin show. Knowles just makes stuff up. I just kind of <laughs> babble. Completely different. But mm -hmm. this is, this is the, beauty, the beautiful part of our life and the beautiful part I think of our working relationships, so I want to thank all of you for being a part of it tonight. The, the, I do think that we should uh, end with a political observation, since that is our uh, MO. MO. And uh, so uh, if we could just go around and, and very briefly, uh, the speech tonight, I think we all have similar feelings about State of the Union generally, uh, but what do we think is coming? You know, that's the, the number one thing that people want to know when they ask us questions in the, in the thread and, and elsewhere. They want to know what we think is coming. You know, people, especially in this media environment, don't feel like they're getting, uh, they don't feel like they're getting a straight answer, and they feel unsettled. They don't know what's coming. Uh, we don't know what's coming either. That's not our uh, purview. Um, but what is the political season? What's in front of us? Where do you think that uh, Trump's next move is going to be? And is it something that people on our, you know, conservatives should look forward to or, or be concerned about? You're looking at me? I'm looking at you. I know what's coming, actually, and I never predict the future. More hate. Mm. The, the left yells at us for hate. Was there a word of hate said, at least since I've been here or heard you guys before? <laughs> they yell at us for hate, but I, I never hear the hate that they're talking about. I, I, I don't know where, where, where is it. I, 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 it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm oblivious to it, but I, 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 I don't see it. I don't hear it. They hate. They hate us, all of us. It's not just Trump. They wouldn't hate Pence. They wouldn't hate uh, Cruz. I mean, please. They hated George W. Bush, the Mr. Compassion. The nicest Mitt guy ever. Uh, they was. hated yeah. Mitt Romney. The cleanest the, person ever. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he, he, uh, frighteningly so. Yeah, it makes me look like yes. a sailor, yeah. That's yeah. right, exactly. <laughs> that's a good way of putting it, actually, now that I think of it. Uh, but uh, that's what's coming. Yeah. And uh, we, we never try uh, to shut them up. No, we don't. Uh, and the, the, look, I'll, I'll just end with this. I, I, whenever I talk privately with Republican congressmen or senators, I have the same exact message. You are not 
when you run for office, you are not only running, you must not only run against your opponent. You must explain to the voters the left is destroying Western civilization, generally and America specifically. That's why you have to vote for me, even if you don't like me. Because we, this party, the Republican, with all its f fools and flaws and everything, is, is, is the boy with the finger in his dike. The left doesn't give a damn about retaining America as America. And you, if you say that, that's powerful. Did, did you, st do you agree with, ask, every Republican should ask the person they're running against, do you agree with Congressman Kennedy that this, if we build a wall, you'll tear it down? They will, that, that, is, that is, I want to know your answer, my worthy opponent here in Missouri. That's, that's what needs to be done. The big issues, you must get on to the big issues. And, and that's the only way that we have to educate Americans uh, about the threat that they pose. Okay, so the, I mean, I, I obviously agree with the 30,000 foot analysis. What's gonna happen next tomorrow morning is Trump's gonna tweet something and we'll stop talking <laughs> about the State of the Union. Uh, I mean, I think that the next thing that happens this week, because I, mean, I, I have a better track record of predicting what happens this week than three <laughs> months out, and Michael Knowles has a check to prove it, um, <laughs> among others, many others. But, uh, the, but uh, I think that the, the, re the memo, the release of this House Intelligence memo, which is going to happen later this week, is going to blow all of the coverage of the State of the Union off the map. Sure. Uh, everybody's yep. going to be talking about the State of the Union for the next 30 seconds. As soon as we sign off, that's pretty much it. Uh, and then the memo, I mean, Trump, apparently wants to release this memo. And so we're gonna get a giant fight over a memo whose underlying intelligence no one in the public has read. Uh, and this, yeah. I think, is deeply troubling. I, I, I think that people want the fight more than they wanna know what the fight is about anymore. And we have to, this is why I agree with Dennis, that we have to get back to fundamental principles. But that also requires a certain level of intellectual honesty. So before I condemn the entire, F, consign the entire FBI to the flames of perdition and say that everything the FBI is doing on anything or special counsel Mueller, uh, that all of that stuff is nonsense. I want to see all the information come out. So I think that we, not only as conservatives, but just as decent human beings, we should say, let's see all the information, let's, uh, uh, let's call lies what they are. I mean, the idea that Trump-Russia collusion, there's been no evidence to prove that whatsoever. But let's also wait for all the information to come out, because if we don't, we're going to get dragged into a really nasty partisan fight, particularly over the next couple weeks, with the Democrats releasing their memo, and Nunes releasing his memo, and none of the underlying material being released into the public, and we're going to hear Republicans claiming that the FBI needs to be shut down, and You'd Democrats You'd like the claiming, president to declassify the classified. I want the president to declassify as much of this as humanly yeah, possible so we can get correct. to the bottom of this, and then we can actually determine what's real and what's false. And by the way, it's quite possible that the FBI did nothing wrong in launching the investigation, but still came up with nothing. Right? It is quite possible that all of the, that the FBI was compromised on Hillary, but not compromised on Trump Russia. It's possible they were compromised on everything. But what I'd like, and I think what where where conservatives are going to be safe, uh, is is not by making bets on stuff that we don't know, mm -hmm. but simply by saying things that we do. And right now, we just don't have enough information to say what's going on yet. I, I think uh, you know, just as my role in our our group, I have to take a, a, a somewhat broader cultural view. I think we are in a strangely beautiful moment. I think that for the last maybe 50 years, a fog, a smothering fog of political correct silence has been wrapping itself around us and silencing not only what we say, but sometimes even what we are allowed to think. And I think that fog has been blown away. And it has not just been blown away by Trump. He's a representative of the fact that the people in America are not like the people in Europe. They will not sit and mutter into their beer. They will ultimately rise up and say, you know what? You're lying. We won't lie. We're not going to tell lies. And suddenly it has become all right to speak mm -hmm. the facts again. Not, you know, as you say, Dennis, not hateful facts. It's not hate hateful to say that terrorism uh, is inspired by Islam. It's not hateful to say there's crime in black neighborhoods. It's not hateful to say that men and women are different. It's simply the truth. It's hateful not to it's say it. It's hateful not That's to right. say it because keeping the truth from people simply makes them enraged over time. I think what's, what's strangely, why I say this is a strangely beautiful moment is because it's like lancing a boil. There's a lot of pain involved in the truth 
that has been hidden suddenly coming out. Mm -hmm. And you, you notice it in this, mo in this very moment with this FBI thing. It's painful for me, for you to see an, an organization. I've worked with FBI people as a reporter. They're usually incredibly competent, incredibly talented people. I feel deeply for the little guy in Atlanta, the Atlanta Bureau who's busting some criminal uh, who's now stained by what happened in the Obama administration. This boil has to be lanced. And I think that a lot of the pain that we're feeling, a lot of the division we're feeling, is, is a good thing. It's, a, it's letting this poison out, this poison of silence, this poison of lies that we have been surrounded by. And people like us, you know, we only have our little corner to fight, but we are saying what we mean. We're saying what we think. And, and that's a, that was not happening 10 years ago. And that's, a, that's an amazing thing. It's a beautiful thing. And I try to keep that in mind because I understand the divisions are painful and the exposure of the truth is painful. But what we're going toward, I think, is actually a good thing. More honesty, more truth, and more simple reality. I agree with all of that. I think it's quite important to be, especially going off what you've said, Dennis, it's important to be wise as a serpent and innocent as a dove. Yeah. The Democrats are innocent as serpents and wise as doves. <laughs> Many times, uh, Republicans may, may have been wise as doves. They're, all, they're innocent as doves. They, they uh, haven't captured what reality is throwing at them. And what we saw tonight in this speech, what we saw in how uh, Donald Trump played the Democrats and forced them into a corner, is that I think this guy is wise as a serpent and I think he's innocent as a dove from this first year that we've seen from him in a, in a very political sense, and I think that's very encouraging. I, I leave the speech Never, hopeful. You, you, using the word innocent with regard to President Trump is... <laughs> I mean, that, a you may, you may, you may be in a political a little bit. sense, I'm using it. Yeah, it's a little stormy. It's a little stormy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think everyone... Uh, I, I agree largely with what everyone said. I, I would add to your concern about lancing the boil, though, Drew, that it's not only the truth being revealed that's painful, but the process by which truth is currently being revealed is also painful. Uh, I think for people like Ben and I in particular in this company, uh, that's been one of the, the biggest challenges uh, over the last year is that uh, Trump is a blunt instrument. And he's, I don't think that he is necessarily motivated by the things that motivate the five of us, uh, the, the philosophical things that motivate the five of us, the values that motivate the five of us. Uh, but by this weird moment of providence, he he is largely being used to advance the things that motivate us. Uh, and I, I, I don't say being used as always a puppet. That's not what I mean to imply. I think it's far more complicated than that. I think, for example, uh, that Donald Trump's history has been far more left than his presidency has been. I think that if Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi hadn't been reactionary partisans, they probably could have made deals with him early in his presidency and he would have been happy to have signed deals that would have made many of the people who supported him on this couch uh, very upset. But strangely, he is the man of this moment where their, their inability to grab an advantage for partisan reasons created a framework in which Trump has operated as a great advocate uh, of, of our policy preferences. What, what concerns me from the speech, obviously the same things that concern everyone here, you know, the talk about paid maternity leave, talk about trillion dollar infrastructure spending. Uh, I, I'm worried about his tendencies towards left policy. What gives me hope is the fact that the Democrats couldn't even clap for those things. <laughs> That's right. I, I think that they are, if you'll excuse the term, constitutionally incapable uh, <laughs> oh, li wow. uh, uh, of, of making deals with him. And that leaves us in a great position where we could, we could see uh, We've already seen some, the most conservative year of governance that's right. in our lifetimes. Weird, yeah. Weird, yeah. 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 And, and to the original question of is, n is never Trump a continuing phenomenon? And, and is it a continuing, if it is, is it a major continuing phenomenon? Uh, you know, we'll, we'll know the answer to that in three years because never Trump was fundamentally an, an electoral consideration. Mm -hmm. and I think it's fair to say that even many of us who dislike the president uh, on a character level uh, are going to have a very hard time making some of the arguments that we were making in the last election when he was an unknown, I didn't see any reason to be confident that he would advance our policy agenda. The proof is in the pudding. So far, he really has advanced our, our policies, and, and that definitely has to change the calculations. The other thing that changes the calculation, even on the character side, is that Trump has been the president. And so if your fear well, he was evidence, he yeah. doesn't have the, if, he, if you say he doesn't have the character to be president, well, that's no longer <laughs> right. <laughs> that's no longer that's true. Absolutely but you don't right. have to speculate about the damage or the benefit. The damage exactly. or the benefit will be there, yeah. and then you can make a call. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So I think a lot of the things that have divided uh, us as Republicans over the last 
18 to 24 months. I think we're going to see the party consolidating more and more back to its old uh, sort of framework, not necessarily changing all of our opinions about Trump, uh, but changing our view of what Trump means in the moment in which we, yeah, I, in the I, moment I, which we live. Again, thank you to everybody who, uh, uh, who tuned in for the last four hours. I want to thank uh, the guys. If you want to catch us, you can come over to thedailywire.com. We'd love it if you'd uh, visit us. Love it even more if you would subscribe, and especially Dennis Prager for joining us. The Dennis Prager Show, Honor, nationally syndicated, and Prager University, uh, named after his uncle Murray. Thank you guys very much. <laughs> <laughs> the American dream is Donald Trump.